Um, well, for this uh, last uh, seminar, I, I, I'm going to, to go in, in a somewhat different direction from the, the ones uh, before. And I, I want to talk about a, a, a more methodological uh, issue, which uh, arises for, I think, for um, most of uh, philosophy, but uh, it's uh, particularly significant in epistemology. I mean, not necessarily more than some other branches, but it's, it's certainly one which um, concerns epistemology. And um, it's, it's one which, which could also, in particular, concerns the, the use of uh, formal methods in, in epistemology. So we, 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 we had some of those, uh, particularly in uh, discussing um, the uh, interaction between um, modal operators and, um, and functional norms uh, in the, uh, the second uh, class. And, and, um, and we were, we, we've also been discussing things that, uh, related to uh, the Bayesian tradition of uh, formal uh, epistemology, uh, in including the, the role of uh, credences uh, in epistemology. Um, but, uh, but now I want to, as would look at some, some more general issues and, and a methodology which hasn't played a, a especially prominent role in the, the previous four seminars, but um, which I think has a, a, a lot of uh, potential in epistemology. I mean, that has, is already in use, but I think uh, c can be used more broadly uh, than it is. And uh, this also has some interest um, from the, uh, the point of view of progress in philosophy, uh, where the, this kind of question which philosophers often find a bit embarrassing about um, how, how much progress uh, philosophy has uh, made. And um, we, you know, we, often, we, we, we get a bit embarrassed when people ask us, you know, so, so what have philosophers discovered recently? And uh, that sort of, it's hard, it's hard to provide a, what feels like a very convincing uh, answer. Um, and, and I think part of what's going on here is that we're comparing philosophy with natural science. Um, and, and we have a certain kind of actually somewhat stereotyped uh, picture of, of what constitutes progress in natural uh, science. And uh, then we're thinking, well, natural science has made lots of progress of, uh, of that kind. And, uh, and it doesn't seem that uh, the, in philosophy, we've done much of that. So, so things are looking r pretty bad if we expect uh, philosophy to, to make progress, as I certainly hope it does. Um, and I think the, the stereotype that we tend to be uh, assuming uh, in this sort of uh, context is, is one where uh, scientific progress consists in the discovery of new laws of, of nature, I mean, progress in the, the natural sciences, where laws of nature are thought of, at the very least, as uh, exceptionless generalizations that, that are also um, highly informative. And then it seems, you know, if we look at philosophy, there's not very much of the going on that, that we could describe in those terms. Of course, in the particular case of uh, logic, it, it seems that, uh, that we do a fair amount of that. But I mean, logic is quite clearly um, a bit of um, an outlier as, as far as philosophical methodology uh, goes. And I think, although, I mean, the first point that I want to, uh, to make is that an awful lot of progress in the natural sciences does not consist of the discovery of new natural uh, laws. Uh, it consists of something else which 
uh, we, we can describe the, the building of um, better and better models of the phenomena in which we are interested. And uh, as I go on, I'll, I'll explain more by what I uh, mean by that. So, but uh, you're just as an initial uh, take on it, I'm thinking of scientific uh, models as um, typically mathematical models of the phenomenon of interest of an extremely simplified and uh, idealized uh, form, but yet which in some way capture enough uh, about the phenomenon of interest to be very revealing, so that by uh, exploring these models, which can be done mathematically, we also learn very significant uh, facts about the, the phenomena that we're uh, ultimately interested in, which is the, uh, as well, the, the external uh, f phenomenon. So just to give you an, uh, an example of, of this, um, you know, a, a typical uh, model in um, biology might consist of um, one in which you, you, you look at the, the, the change in the, uh, the population of um, uh, some predator species and some prey species. So, that, as it were, uh, the uh, population of uh, foxes and a population of uh, rabbits and uh, and the model just concerns how many foxes there are and how many rabbits there are. Those 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 are the only two two variables that you study and um, and then you can you can write down some uh, equations uh, which which govern um, how these uh, these variables uh, change. I mean, so that. Uh, for example, you know, the more foxes there are, there are the, more the, the more foxes there are to eat rabbits, but uh, the more rabbits uh, there are, the, um, the more there is for the foxes to eat, and, and so on. And, and, so, and you can write down differential equations and solve these equations. I mean, these are I think, called the uh, Lotke, uh, Lotke uh, Volterra uh, equations, um, which were if I remember right, where they were originally introduced, but when people were studying the way that populations of various species of fish had uh, changed during the First World War in the Adriatic. Uh, um, and and, and there, were, there were certain patterns of a, of a rather complex kind in the, um, the way the, the two populations were going up and down. Um, I mean, these are um, extremely simplified models because uh, all we're looking at is uh, two species as if as if any other species were just uh, ir irrelevant um, and uh, we're holding everything else constant we're assuming that the environment is constant and so on and we're, and we're not we're not differentiating between the um, different members of the same species or uh, anything like that we're just looking at at total numbers and uh, and so nobody would uh, expect these kind of models uh, to be as to give exact quantitative predictions because uh, the, 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 the I mean there's not going to be any uh, situation in nature which exactly corresponds to them and yet from these equations you can predict some of the same kind of qualitative features in the the way that the uh, increase and decreases of one population uh, go with the increases and decreases uh, of uh, another. And uh, actually, I remember talking to a, 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 a German um, biologist uh, who's, who has a lot of philosophical interests, and he was, he was saying to me that um, he found a lot of work in the philosophy of biology not really uh, relevant uh, to the kind of biology that he was doing because it, uh, it involved the assumption that what biologists were looking for was, as were, laws of biology. And, um, and 
he, that just didn't correspond to the kind of thing that the biologists he knew were doing. They, they, they were not expecting to find any laws in the sense of exceptionless generaliza uh, generalizations about uh, you know, uh, specifically biological uh, f phenomena. Um, of course, biological phenomena, are, I mean, they're governed by basic physical laws, but, but the question would be whether there are distinctive laws of biology, and they were not expecting that. What they were expecting was that um, biological phenomena are so complex and messy um, that even at the level of cells and, and so on, that, that you, you can't expect to understand them by laws. Uh, what you can expect to do is to understand them by making models of them, which uh, explain enough of what you're interested in to give you uh, some kind of uh, insight. Um, and so, it, w w when you have a, a branch of science that's working in that kind of way, progress consists in the construction of, uh, and exploration of better models um, rather than of any kind of uh, universal uh, uh, laws. And what I want to uh, suggest is that some, by no means all, of uh, philosophy may be making a kind of progress that, as it were, passes under our radar because it's not the sort of progress that we're looking for, because it's not the discovery of, uh, of uh, new laws, but, but it consists in better um, models for the things that we're interested in. Um, and the, the kind of areas w where this is likely to be particularly relevant in philosophy are areas uh, where the phenomena that we're discussing are a kind of complex, messy uh, phenomena. So it, it, in the area of, um, of logic, um, where at least we're not, we're not interested in the, uh, as it were, the, f specifically in the kind of phenomena that have this messy sort of quality. I mean, we, we can have generalizations about all phenomena, but, but we're not looking for specific ones to, for the, uh, that fit these characteristically a kind of messy, uh, complex phenomena. Th th then we can, in logic, we can expect universal generalizations. And maybe in some parts of fundamental metaphysics, uh, we can e expect uh, exceptionless generalizations. But in many, many areas of, uh, of philosophy, when, when, uh, when we are looking at complex, messy phenomena, in particular, because the phenomena of interest are primarily human phenomena, and of course humans are you know, an, a, a, a classic example of complex, uh, messy systems. Um, and well, in the, in the case of, uh, of epistemology, uh, it's not that we're only interested in, um, in human uh, knowledge. I mean, we, as I've been emphasizing, we, we should also be interested in the, the knowledge of uh, non-human animals, and of course, uh, you know, in principle, we can be interested even in the the kind of knowledge that an infinite mind might possess. But 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 those are also highly complex uh, phenomena, and and it and it, it it's inevitably going to be the case that as well the the kind of examples of knowledge that, that we're concerned with about 90% of the time in epistemology are, are going to involve human knowledge because uh, that's what we're, we're most uh, familiar with as well as, uh, as well as most interested in. And, uh, and so we, the, as well, the examples that we, that we have the best understanding of are going to be uh, human ones. I mean, I would say that the same applies to an awful lot of the rest of philosophy. I mean, for example, in philosophy of language, we're primarily concerned with human language. Um, in, in moral philosophy and political philosophy, we're primarily concerned with human action, human societies. Uh, in you know, aesthetics, we're primarily concerned with, with human art and, and so on. Um, so, you know, prima facie, it, it looks as though 
um, this, this kind of methodology is, uh, is going to be uh, relevant to, um, to epistemology and a lot of other branches uh, of philosophy as, as well. Um, So well, a couple of, of p further points of, uh, about this. I mean, one, one is that when I'm talking about model building, I am not thinking that, as it were, all of natural science, or even most you know, of natural science, must consist in model building. I mean, something that's quite uh, re revealing about the role of model building in, in science. I mean, <laughs> Is it, it's very much not the way that model, models in science used to be discussed, where it, there was, sometimes there were attempts to say that, you know, that all of science just is model building, or, and that, or to give accounts of models which applied to all uses of the word model. But, um, but something which makes it clear that we're, we're, we're concerned with something more specific than that is, is that um, research teams in, in natural science will, will often advertise a position as a model builder. I mean, that's what it's called. Um, and they're not, it's not that every member of the research team will be a model builder, um, but it's just that some will be. Um, and, and so it, it's, it's, as it were, a, a fairly recognizable um, activity amongst those in the repertoire of natural uh, science. I mean, you might think, that, that somehow that this is, is not really going to be relevant to uh, philosophy because uh, natural science uh, is a, uh, a predictive activity and um, that these predictions, even if they're not, as we're meant to be 100% accurate, should still be quantitative uh, predictions and uh, that, that that seems very different from what uh, one expects in philosophy. That doesn't, unless w w the idea is that, that we've been doing philosophy totally wrong. There, um, that that doesn't seem to be what we should be trying to provide. But I think it, once you once you see the range of model building activities in natural science, you realise that there is much more scope for uh, as were well, some of them to to be more similar to what we do in philosophy. So just to give another biological example, the, the kind of thing that biologists are interested in is um, why, why is two-sex reproduction the, the norm across a huge range of species? And why don't we see lots of species which are reproduced by, by having three sexes rather than two? And um, Th that's a question, uh, as it were, about uh, w you know, explaining an absence um, and a, a very natural way of uh, um, answering it is by building models of three sex reproduction with just notional species and, uh, and seeing what, as were, what, if anything, goes wrong. I mean, that, so that, for, you know, for example, it might be that, that you find that with three sex reproduction that, that you, 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 you don't get this, the right kind of variation in the gene pool or something that, like that that makes the species, that gives it the kind of resources to adapt to changes in the environment, you know, whatever it is. But, but I think in, in a case like that where you're not, you're not trying to predict numbers, you're just trying to explore a... Uh, a, f a phenomenon by seeing hypothetically how it would work, um, then, then that seems uh, somewhat closer to the kind of things that we do in philosophy. So l let me give you uh, the a, a definition of uh, a model as I'm uh, understanding it. Um, so sometimes in the, in the literature on models in science, the definitions that you get seem too geared to a specific uh, scientific activity and just, just not really appropriate to philosophy. But I think there is something that's quite, in fact, quite um, similar uh, as long as one looks at the right aspects of it. So, so I, I, I've defined a model here as a, um, of a, a model of a phenomenon it, it, um, as simply as a hypothetical example of it, but then with various glosses on that. I put in 
non-logical sense because in, in logic there's a, uh, a very specific notion of uh, a, a, a model uh, um, related to model theoretic uh, semantics and so on, which is it, not totally different, but, but it's not, it's not the, the sense of model that I'm concerned with, uh, with here. And so we need to put that uh, to one side. Um, and when I, when I talk about a hypothetical example of it, I mean, the hypothetical means in part that we're talking about a type of phenomenon. We're not, uh, we're not talking about a particular uh, example of the phenomenon. So, so if the phenomenon that we're interested in is the in, uh, interaction of a predator species and a prey species, um, I'm not, we're not interested in um, a model where we specify an example by saying we're going to be concerned with the um, increases and decreases of um, populations of foxes and rabbits um, in southern England from 1850 to 1900 or something like that, where you're just taking a particular example. Um, what, what we're concerned with is uh, something, well, we're typically, um, we describe it just in quality, if you like, in, in, some, in qualitative terms. And in, in natural science, that often takes a form of writing down some differential equations. But, um, but, but that aspect of it is, is, is not the, the key one for generalizing to uh, philosophy. Um, and um, and the po I mean, the point of these equations is that, that we can explore mathematically what the consequences of the equations are. So we know, as a word, we can work out, once we've got this precise description of the model, what its logical or mathematical consequences are. And we can do that in you know, a pretty uncontroversial way, because this is, here we're basically just doing mathematics. Um, and, and so, you know, whatever we think of the phenomenon itself, we should be able to agree about what the, the, the consequences of the model themselves are. And, um, and in order to do this, the model has to be sufficiently tractable that we can really work with it. So, um, so it has to be, to be pretty, pretty simple, um, and, uh, which will often involve huge idealizations. So that, as uh, so were, for example, um, rather than discussing the, the you know, a, a model where we have the whole solar system with all the planets and, and all its complexities, we might just be concerned with a model where, where we, you know, we have one star and one orbiting planet and, um, you know, and we treat both the, the star and the planet as just point masses or something like that. Um, and the part of the, I mean, not all of the point, but a lot of the point of this is just so that we can actually work out what the consequences of the model uh, are. And of course, if the, the if the this the model description were mathematically uh, or logically inconsistent, then the, the model would be useless. Um, but surprisingly. Although it, it, we're using the model to describe a hypothetical uh, example of the phenomenon, it is not required that the, the model as described be even metaphysically possible. Um, I mean, you, that sounds a bit odd, but in fact, it's, it's something that's already implicit in what I've been saying, because if you, if you take the... Um, the standard equations for this model of the predator-prey interaction. So these are equations where the variables are the number of foxes at a given time, well, time, number of foxes, and, and number of, um, of rabbits, or, or number of predator species in the predator population, a number in the prey population. So since, since these are uh, um, differential equations, um, the, they're, the variables that they're concerned with are, um, are continuous ones. They're, so the populations are being modeled as varying continuously. So that means that you know, if, the, uh, if at one, you know, one time we have 199 rabbits, and then you know, the next day we have 200 rabbits, in the model, 
there's going to be an intermediate time at which we have 199.5 rabbits, right? Because because the population in the model has to has to vary uh, continuously. But of course, I mean there is there's no time. I mean, time where the number of rabbits is 199.5 in reality. So, and, and there couldn't be, because, because we, we, um, we're asking how many rabbits, and 199.5 is not a cardinal number. It's not an answer to the question, how many. Um, so, I mean, that's just a kind of a, a relatively trivial example of the way in which these models don't, strictly speaking, even describe metaphysical possibilities. And yeah, I think you can e easily see that a model of predator-prey interaction that treated the populations as continuous variables could, despite doing so, and therefore in a way being metaphysically impossible, could very easily just cast a lot of light on the, the phenomenon uh, of, of interest. Right, so uh, I'm, I'm now going to talk about how this w plays out in, a, in epistemology, but if anybody got some questions about what I've been saying about the sort of general scientific case, and, and now would be a good time to, to ask them. Uh, yes, I think, yes, we do. My question is, uh, when uh, in the handout uh, I read the example is a type, uh, not a token. Yes. I understand that. And uh, in a way, I think that uh, um, even the ancient terminology for this kind of extraction of types uh, can help uh, identifying which kind of job is behind the identification of this example. I mean, uh, if uh, the Greek word is paradigma, and uh, the uh, Latin word which comes after that is exemplum, it means that it is not just one among others, but it is that kind, in a way, of token which better than others uh, represents a certain kind of phenomena and can become a real paradigmatic case uh, after which uh, we can abstract some properties or structural yes. relations and so on that in a way help us in identifying what is typical and what uh, um, helps us not uh, uh, being uh, overwhelmed but too many uh, details, uh, yes. too many particular accidents uh, which prevent us uh, from identifying what uh, has to be considered as essential or really typical. Yes. Is this acceptable? So I think I, I, certainly the idea that, that these are um, good things to study um, because they help us not be overwhelmed by, the, as it were, all the, the detail. I think that's exactly right. Um, I wouldn't say that the models in the sense that I'm talking about um, are typical examples in the contemporary sense. Because, for example, you know, if you take predator-prey interaction, it is not typical. That, that we have two species interacting with each other with, with no um, interaction with any other species at all. That, I mean, in, in, in nature, that, that's totally untypical. Um, and so, so what we don't, I mean, there are, you know, there are different dimensions here. And what, we, what we're not looking for is, as it were, is a kind of average case. What we're looking for is an, if you like, an untypically simple, simple case. Um, but, but the idea that, that it's a case such that just by concentrating on it, we can see w what, what really matters and, and kind of r filter out a lot of the kind of noise that we're, we're, is involved in, as we're just direct <laughs> empirical study of, of the phenomenon. That, that's exactly right, yes. Any other question? Oh, yes, and I think one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, okay. oh, oh, yes, a follow up maybe. I, I didn't see you. <laughs> While you are talking, I was thinking of, for instance, Organon Model by Bühler. I mean, in the 30s, he's, uh, he develops uh, um, at least three diagrams in order to identify what is. Uh, 
the simplest way of uh, including all what uh, seems to be really essential to identify uh, the set of a, um, of, a, of a verbal exchange. The further step which uh, lacks uh, to me, because it's not present in that tradition, is the passage to mathematical language. I mean, even a diagram is a great help in uh, concentrating, um, shall, shall we say, factors, ingredients, Yes. of what it seems to be relevant and necessary, of what has not to be forgotten. But uh, this is not yet. The transposition, the paraphrasing, the translation into a formal language or even into a mathematical language. So I think this in the humanities and especially in philosophy would need uh, some further uh, clarification. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. So, so yes, I'll, I'll I'll be saying more about about that. Um, I think it's it's not just. Uh, I mean, the so the, the mathematical case. It's. A, I mean, there are a number of aspects to it. I mean, one is whether we're going quantitative, whether we're we're concerned with with numbers, um, and. That's that's something that you get in in one of the the two main traditions of uh, model building in uh, epistemology, which is the uh, the, the Bayesian uh, probabilistic uh, tradition, where of course we, we we're concerned with um, with mathematical um, probabilities, which which are numbers between zero and one, and uh, and so there's a the, kind of very evidently. Uh, mathematical aspect uh, to that, but the the other um, main tradition in formal epistemology, which has been providing uh, models in the sense that I'm talking about, um, is the tradition of epistemic logic, um, which has has generally not been concerned with as with the quantitative side uh, at all. I mean, these these are um, I mean, the models that, that we're concerned with in epistemic logic are typically ones where we're not interested in uh, the quantitative side, but nevertheless these models are described in set theoretic language, and they're described with mathematical precision. And I, I, and I think the, um, that, in a way, is, is the, for methodological purposes, is the more important aspect because once we've got a model that is described in, in a mathematically precise way then as well we can treat the model as something autonomous we can we can investigate questions about how the model works without any reference back to the original phenomenon so as well we can we can rigorously avoid cheating in that sense by um, but by simply studying the model in this rigorous way, working out what its uh, consequences are. And we can do that just as well with non-quantitative but mathematically precise models as with, um, with uh, quantitative uh, models. Um, so, oh, but, and of course, it, I mean, one thing, I, yeah, just, a, just a little comment about the way that formal epistemology uh, has gone. Um, so the, the the tradition of models within the of, you know, of the probabilistic kind, typically within the tradition of uh, Bayesian uh, epistemology. I mean that really goes back to um, people like Ramsey and De Finetti in the the nineteen twenties. Um, and uh, and it's 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 a long-standing uh, uh, tradition, um, which for a long time was very separate uh, from um, the mainstream uh, tradition in uh, epistemology. And I mean, partly I think because it uh, it was in the 30s and 40s and 50s, it was mainly 
being developed within the overall tradition of logical positivism um, at, by people who, um, who, who who didn't really want to uh, to make epistemology normative except for very um, formal normative constraints of uh, basically of, of roughly speaking consistency and or slightly more generally of probabilistic uh, coherence that was I mean developed by you know people you know Carnap and Jeffrey and uh, and so on and and so that meant that um, that it was developed in a way which didn't seem to have very much bearing on a lot of the questions that epistemologists were uh, concerned with about, for example, about the nature of knowledge or anything like that, because um, they were just concerned with something more like coherent belief in, in a quantitative uh, sense. The, the other main uh, tradition um, of epistemic logic, I mean, the, the, the key work there w was one by um, a book published by Jaco Hintiker in the early 1960s, called uh, Knowledge and uh, Belief, um, which was concerned with issues much closer to those of, of um, traditional epistemology, but it, which for a long time, sorry, sorry. <coughs> um, for a long time also had virtually no effect on the <coughs> mainstream of, of epistemology. Be and, I think, and I think the reason that it had so little effect was because people were not familiar with the model building methodology and, and didn't really understand um, what role models could play in uh, understanding uh, phenomena. Um, I I think over the over the past twenty years or so, uh, things have improved a, a lot in epistemology, uh, and I, 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 in particular, the, the formal epistemology and sort of mainstream in, informal epistemology have come somewhat closer together. I mean, there's still some formal epistemology that's done with with no no interest in the, the mainstream tradition, and, and there's some of the mainstream tradition that shows no interest in formal epistemology. But the, but there's also a lot of uh, crossover work where people are uh, using formal formal methods, but in a way which is much more richly informed by uh, serious epistemological uh, concerns um, and. Um, and I think there's, there's room for, for that to be taken uh, a lot further. And, uh, and there's also room for the, the two traditions of formal epistemology to, um, to merge and for us to work with models that can have both the, the structure of sort of Hintiker style models, but also have a, a probabilistic uh, component uh, built, built over that. Um, and so, that, so what, I, what I'm going to talk about is just some, some very simple examples of, um, of models in the epistemic uh, logic uh, tradition. Um, just, just to give those of you who, who are not familiar with them a flavor of what I'm talking about, because I don't want this to, to be too much um, just in, in the abstract. Um, and for, for those of you who are very familiar with the kind of thing that I'm, I'm talking about, uh, uh, apologies, but, but, the, but I think that these will, the kind of models that I'm going to talk about, although they're simple, they already give rise to, to many of the sort of distinctive methodological issues that, uh, that we're concerned with um, in, in model building. So, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll describe these models. I, I, so, I, I, well, I, I said uh, on the handout a frame is an ordered pair, but actually, the, the, I decided uh, originally I was just going to talk about uh, ones where we were modelling knowledge, but then I decided to add belief as well, and so I should have said I should have changed that to a frame is an ordered triple. So it's it, it, um, this is halfway down the first page of the handout. So w what we've got here is a, a, we've got a set W, which as far as the 
<laughs> these formal models go. Uh, this W could be any set whatsoever. It doesn't matter what its, um, its members are really. But the way we're going to think of them is as something like worlds, or if you like, maximal states of affairs. And, and we've got two binary relations uh, in, in this uh, frame as well. Um, over W. So these are binary relations relating um, members of W, relate, uh, relations between worlds. Um, and in describing this, I'm, I'm just going to talk about one, um, one of these frames as fixed and what's going uh, on with it. So we're going to have a, a very coarse grained view of uh, propositions in this model. So propositions are just sets of worlds. So they're subsets of uh, big W. Um, and, and those subsets are just going to have the, 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 the normal sort of structure on them. And w so the way we're thinking of it, it, uh, if, it, so if you've got a member of a little W that's a, a world, um, then what it means for little and, and let's say P, which is a proposition, which is a subset of W, what it means for W to be a little w to be a member of P is, in effect, for a P to be true at W. So W is one of the worlds where P is, uh, is true. And, um, and that means that, uh, we, that conjunction of propositions is just set theoretic intersection, uh, disjunction is uh, set theoretic union, and uh, and the negation of P, um, not P, is um, the set theoretic complementation. So it's um, W minus P. In other words, um, the negation of P is a set of worlds that don't belong to P. Um, so that's you know if you're used to that kind of thing, that's just uh, the the way. Um, things go anyway, and then and we can uh, we can talk about, for example, entailment relations between uh, propositions um, in this model just in the usual way. So that if we want to say that the two propositions P and Q uh, entail a third proposition R, that that just means that the intersection of P and Q is a subset of R because because this means where every world where both P and Q and true. Uh, uh, P and Q are true is a world where R is true. So, so the W by, just by itself gives us our, um, our framework of propositions. Um, and, and then we're going to use these uh, two um, binary relations, RK and, R, and RB, to encode all the stuff about how knowledge and belief uh, work uh, in this uh, frame. Um, so, our, I mean, the K is for knowledge and B for belief, of course. Um, so, so what, what we mean when we say that um, the relation RK stands uh, between a world W and a world X is um, that everything that's true, sorry, everything that's known at, um, at W is true at X, which it, you can think of as if, if, you're in, if you're in the world W, then for all you know, you're in X. Um, and, uh, and, we can th and we can also talk about this as X being epistemically accessible uh, from W. And then what we have to do is to uh, define um, a knowledge uh, operation um, on propositions. So it's, it's an operation which takes the proposition P to the proposition that one knows P. And wh when I say one knows, uh, in kind of informally understanding um, these, th these models, we, we have to suppose that we have a, a given agent and a, a given time, uh, which are fixed, but, but as well, the model doesn't tell us what those, those are. Um, so, w w one thing to, to emphasize here is that 
everything about the epistemological interpretation is just uh, some informal stuff that has to do with how we're going to use these models. It has nothing whatsoever, as it, were, it, it plays no constitutive role in, how the, in the model itself. It's, the model itself is just this mathematical thing which works the way it works. And th this, but this is how we're going to, as it were, informally interpret it, which is exactly the same as with models in natural science, where you have these, you know, th these uh, differential equations, which are just equations for, um, you know, on various continuous variables. And it's simply from the informal uh, outside that we're thinking of them as equations relating time and uh, the number of fo foxes or the number of predators and the number of prey. Um, and um, so, the, so in the case of the of the knowledge operator, the the, this, the key definition is is this that um, oops. so the, what we we've got the set P, which is just any old proposition, and now we want to define. The, the set KP, and KP is to consist of the set of worlds where one knows P. And, and so knowing P is, is going to be modeled uh, here by P holding in all the epistemically accessible worlds, um, which are the ones, that, the, the worlds that, that um, I mean, the epistemically accessible worlds from W are the ones that um, W has the ex epistemic accessibility relation to. So, so all of the all of the ones all of the worlds that, as it were, for all you know, you're in have to be ones uh, where um, P is true. That's what that's saying. So that's that's. Formally, this is a definition of uh, the knowledge operator um, in, in terms of epistemic accessibility. And it, or you could think of it as a definition of knowledge, because you can, I mean, this is just equivalent to saying that, that to say that W is a member of KP is just to say that at, at W, one knows, one knows P, and then, uh, and then, that's the condition for, for knowing uh, P at, at W. So, you, you, what this looks like is a definition of knowledge uh, in terms of uh, epistemic accessibility. But I don't think that from a philosophical point of view, one has to interpret that as somehow epistemic accessibility being something that's more basic than knowledge. I think it's much more that um, this is an efficient way of uh, encoding the facts about knowledge into a, a, a single uh, accessibility uh, relation. And, and then this definition is really just a decoding again what the, what the uh, um, epistemic accessibility relation has put into the, um, the model. Now, this, this definition, simply by its structure, has a lot of quite significant uh, consequences for the, for the, the structure of, uh, of knowledge. Um, so uh, I've, I've mentioned the, the, the key ones on the handout, so let's, let's just go through them quickly, and then I'll, I'll say something about these. So the, the, what this is telling, see, W is, w is the, if you like, the tautological proposition. And, and, and so saying that K of W is W, what that actually tells you is that the tautological proposition is known at all the worlds in the, um, that we're in, in W. In big, so it's known everywhere. So um, we, th in these models, it, um, it's impossible not to know the, the tautological proposition. Um, uh, 
And that is not, you know, that's not obviously, um, <laughs> you know, correct. Because, you know, for, for example, well, I, I, I mean, one thing is, of course, we're excluding worlds where the, you know, the agent isn't even alive or something like that, and so knows nothing. But we're also, we're also, this also automatically excludes situations, let's say, I mean, you might think with cats, for example, that they know quite a few things about their environment, but that they don't know any logical truths. <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't seem like cats are, are going to be so great at knowing logical truths. But, um, but that, that is uh, excluded just by the structure of the, uh, the definition. Um, and because if we took W as P here, then, then this, you see, this condition would always be uh, met. So, so that you automatically uh, count as, as knowing any uh, 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 tautology. Um, it's, and you don't, as it were, it's not, it's not saying that, that you have to work it out. It's just that ipso facto you know it. Um, there's a second one which um, is, put it, is this, which, is, which says that you know a conjunction if and only if you know the conjuncts. Um, it, doesn't see, it doesn't seem very demanding to say that if you know the conjunction, then you know the conjuncts. But saying that if you know the, the conjuncts, then you know the conjunction, that seems more demanding because it, it, that wouldn't fit um, as it were, somebody who knew, knew various things but somehow hadn't put all their knowledge together. And, you know, and again, it does seem to be uh, quite possible to have agents uh, who, don't, who don't put their knowledge uh, together. So, so it, the, the left to right direction of this is, is non-trivial. And then um, there's also the condition that if P entails Q, which remember that's represented in the model just by the subset relation, then KP entails KQ. So that's saying that wherever there's um, P entails Q, if you know P, then you know Q. And it's, and it's not saying provided that you've done the, the deduction or anything like that. It's just saying that as a way, you ips, if you know P, you ipso facto uh, knew, know Q. Um, and so again, that's, that's not at all trivial. I mean, because um, it, it can be really, really hard to, um, to work out the, the logical consequences of what one knows. Um, and, and so th th these, these sorts of features are known you know, in the literature as logical omniscience, that the models somehow uh, treat agents um, as, as having perfect no knowledge of lo logic. Any limitations on their knowledge are coming from elsewhere. Uh, in fact, if you, if you think about it a bit more, you realize that th there are two kind of sources for the logical omniscience that are, are coming in here. Um, one of them just has to do with the way that propositions are represented in the model, simply as sets of worlds. And and the other has to do with um, with the, the more the specific structure of um, of the definition of of knowledge here, um, so that I mean you already get a certain amount of uh, logical omniscience just from the the. the the representation of propositions, because you know, if, if you if you think of um, of two let's say two, let's let's take two um, formulas where we've got some um, atomic sentences, and then and then we're building them up in complicated ways with disjunction, conjunction, and negation. I mean, you, you, you could have two, uh, f two formulas which are, in fact, Boolean uh, equivalents 
um, but where that's not at all obvious. I mean, that's already, we've already to some extent have that uh, with the De Morgan laws in logic, so that, that P or Q is equivalent to the negation of not P and not Q. Um, but that's, that's something that, it does take a bit of uh, thinking to get your head around it. And, and of course, we can have um, much, much more complex uh, equations of, um, of that kind which are true. And, um, and so, those, but those formulas will already be, just by the, the, the way that propositions are being represented in the model, those will be represented by the very same proposition. There's only one proposition there. And in particular, there's, the, there's, only, one, there's only one tautology, but because any tautology is true in all the worlds, and so that the, uh, w, the, on, the only tautology we have is W, uh, the set of all worlds. And so, so one source of... Um, the, the of logical of, a, of a, a, as it were an initial dose of lo logical omniscience is just coming from the way propositions are represented and and we would have that no, no matter how we defined k provided that we had we were defining k as a um, an operator on propositions which was as we're taking a, a proposition as input and giving the proposition that that the first proposition is known as the uh, as, as output. But then there is also um, a further dose of logical omniscience, which is coming from the, the specific uh, operator that we're taking knowledge uh, to be, and this kind of structure in terms of an accessibility relation. And, um, and these, these consequences that I'm putting here, these all depend on, on more than just uh, the, the, the fact that we're representing propositions as possible worlds. Um, and, and I think that the, the initial somewhat negative reaction to uh, Hintika's work amongst the majority of the mainstream epistemological community had to do with logical uh, omniscience. I think what, what people saw w was that, that Hintika's models have, have very strong logical omniscience properties built into them, and they thought, that's crazy, that's not what knowledge is actually like. And, and then their, which in a way was, cor <laughs> argue is correct, um, the and then they, and then they, what they inappropriately did was assume that they didn't really have anything to learn uh, from these models uh, as as a result. Um, so, I mean, I should say that there's, uh, it's, it's not universally agreed that logical omniscience itself is an idealization. So, Stolnaker, it. it is someone who uh, is inclined to think that, that something like this is the real nature of knowledge, and that although it doesn't seem like it, in fact, um, all these consequences are just literally true about knowledge. I mean, he's sort of tempted to, uh, to take that, uh, that view and, is, and has defended that way of thinking, whereas uh, lots of people I uh, think that th that these are just um, at least some of these uh, consequences uh, are just false in in real life. Um, as you'll as you'll see, um, e even if you were to accept these these consequences um, of the models as as literally uh, true, um, there are. There are other aspects of, of, um, of models which, are in some respects, have proved extremely fruitful in epistemic logic, which even Stolmaker would regard as idealization. So that, that uh, I think, from any point of view, the the tradition in epistemic logic has involved quite a lot of idealization. Uh, but th there's a, a dispute about just how much of uh, what we've got is idealization and how much is people somehow being misled by 
uh, the, uh, the way that uh, knowledge states are attributed in, in natural language. Does anybody want to ask questions? Yes, I think we, <laughs> because, because we, as we say, we've, got, we've already got quite a lot of the, the key features of these models uh, um, out it, here. here. Uh, Sorry, once again, uh, I wonder whether this kind of idealized way of treating the objects uh, while modelizing them um, has uh, too much to do with a kind of an idealistic way of conceiving them. I mean, this kind of uh, equation, which seems to be nearly an identification, uh, seems to me quite uh, close to this uh, convertibility of what is real and therefore rational and rational and therefore real and it's quite far from the idea of a simplification which uh, serves like a kind of substitution of the actual uh, situations which are, have to be substituted by the model in order to make a more um, straight uh, and uh, I don't know whether I can say rigorous the way of treating the cases but uh, I, it's such a, a different level that of logical omniscience uh, uh, compared with our human knowledge and approach that this substitution seems to me quite uh, dangerous and not really a service uh, granted to the purpose of uh, uh, substituting in an efficient way in order to be aware of the passages we uh, we do of the relationship we introduce and so on so i do think this is a kind of a delicate uh, passage yes. Sim simplification has not to be simplistic uh, and uh, ideal or typical is not uh, coincident uh, with uh, um, idealized if yes. i may say so thanks yeah so let me say a, a couple of things about that i mean one case uh, w w w but, I mean, first of all, about uh, Stolnaker's attitude. I mean, the attitude of people who, who are saying, well, these, these are not idealizations. This is, this is what knowledge really is. Th they're very much not saying that because they're uh, uh, idealizing human beings as if we were perfectly rational creatures. Um, I mean, this is, this is something that they're thinking of as really just a consequence of something like a functional definition of knowledge that would be applicable even to very, very simple creatures. You know, so that, that I think it would be very much Stolnaker's, you know, you know, that if we can attribute knowledge to animals, that then, then their knowledge will have this structure too. And not because, because they're secretly super brains or anything like that, but because, as well, this is just um, a picture, you know, on, you know, of the knowledge as possession of information in something which is maybe only a step up or two up from the way in which trees can possess information in tree rings and that kind of thing. So that in that sense, uh, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, the Solnaker style view is, is uh, you know, it's, it's not uh, idealization. I mean, you, uh, I mean, you might think it's a very implausible view about, about human Knowledge, but I think one way in which it's, it's implausible is, in a way, that it, it's ignoring an aspect of the way in which human beings are cognitively superior to non-human languages, as well as non-human animals. Which is that with human beings, um, knowledge is something that we can at least often uh, articulate in language and, um, and th that 
in language, because, because uh, our relation to propositions is not just a, a straightforward functional one, but is something mediated by uh, sentences, um, the, and set, where sentences, of course, are much, much finer grained than propositions. I mean, th that itself is, um, is going to have uh, you know, implications for the structure of human knowledge. And even more so, it, when, when we come to belief, I'll mention some ways in which it, uh, this, the, the linguistic structuring uh, is diff uh, makes a difference. Um, and, and so, as it was, Stolmaker is kind of, he's not really uh, taking that as, as a very important aspect of, of knowledge. But, but that's, it, it's not so much, you know, elevating us crazily above the beasts, but, but if you like, it's pulling us down to the, the level of the, the beasts and, and, get, and getting, uh, strangely, a logical omniscience as, uh, as a consequence of that. So it, um, the, the second thing is, so supposing we put this, the, the Stolnaker view aside for the sake of argument, and, uh, and we, we suppose that, that yes, logical omniscience is a, a big idealization. So the, quest, the question is, can we learn anything from these models by making what seems initially like a crazy idealization? Um, and I think the answer is yes, we, we can. And let me, let me give you an example um, of, of the way that, that I found it useful to, uh, to use these models. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that I'm interested in is um, how much or in what ways uh, the limits on uh, our powers of perceptual discrimination have implications for the structure of our knowledge. Um, and, I, and this is actually another, a point where I differ from Stolmaker, but, but I mean, I've argued that, I'll, I'll say more about this in, later, but that, that they, uh, the one effect of the, the limits on, uh, of our paths of perceptual discrimination is, is that we get uh, failures of the, the KK principle, that if you know, you know that you know. And, if we're interested in what are the specific consequences of, the, of these perceptual limitations, we actually want to idealize away from logical limitations because we don't want to look at models where, as it were, the consequences of logical limitations and the consequences of perceptual limitations are all, all just mixed together. So, so we, we want to separate them out, and the natural way of separating them out is to think, let's, as it were, let's, if you like, consider the case of someone who is a perfect logician, but quite short-sighted, literally, literally short-sighted, and um, because then, as it were, any any kind of uh, effects on the structure of their knowledge in that case will be coming from the short-sightedness, not, not because uh, they're, 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 there's anything wrong with their, their knowledge of logic. And so even though that's quite an extreme idealization, it's, it's one that we want to make in order to, to factor out these different aspects. Um, and I mean, as a matter of fact, it seems that If once we, as it were, factor back in the fact that we also have logical uh, limitations as well as perceptual ones, it's not going to make much difference because you know if somebody if somebody fails the KK principle when they're per when they're perfect at logic, it's not as though by getting much worse at logic you'll be become better at knowing <laughs> that you know or at least in the crucial ways. So that um, so that we would the the. The effects are, that are distinctive of perceptual limitations, I mean, they're likely to be robust and, and hold even for creatures which also have logical limitations. It's, so it's just that we've been able to trace where, they, where they're coming from. And, um, you know, and I think that, that that kind of thing is, I mean, that's not just a one-off case. I mean, I think the, the ability to, as it were, 
abstract from certain kinds of complexity in order to understand you know, a given dimension of complexity. That's something that in all sorts of cases we want to be able to do. And, and, when, and when we're making that sort of abstraction, we, it, that may often involve very, very drastic assumptions. Right, because um, you know, typically, typically what what we've got in the in the real case is lots and lots of different dimensions of complexity, all of which are um, pretty much inevitable for human beings. And so, so whenever we abstract away from one of those dimensions, we're abstracting away to something which you know is uh, is we, we, we probably will not expect in any um, feasible human case but nevertheless it's a good abstraction to make so that you know i think i think there really is a, a, a methodological defense of of this admittedly extreme kind of abstraction and and i i think that's that's what a, a lot of mainstream epistemologists haven't fully re recognized that how much there is to learn e even by making these extreme abstractions So I'm afraid I'm going to ask sort of the same question again. I mean, I guess you just said that, but I still don't get it. So I'm going to ask it again. Um, I have nothing against this idea of like making very wild abstractions. The problem is um, I still don't see what the advantage is once we accept um, what we get is not like a very descriptively adequate uh, model of uh, our uh, epistemic structure. Uh, I mean, it, and, and, and I will not go into all the cases where this model would be implausible. You already mentioned some, but I still don't see what we're supposed, what are we using it for? What are the cases where this shines so much that then it's worthy? Okay, so, well, let me give you a simple, a, a, Example. Um, so, so, so here's here's the kind of um, model that I'm interested. This is this is one that it's a nice one to work with because it's got a certain kind of symmetry to, to it. So, th this this is a case where you. Um, you have an uh, an unmarked clock, so it's just it's it's just this um, disc with uh, a single pointer, but there are, you know that, there's nothing that says twelve o'clock or or anything like that, and um, and the idea is that you're supposed to to judge the time just by looking at the clock, okay. And um, uh, and so I think a reasonable model of this. I mean, it, you know, again, I mean, a, a simple one, but a reasonable model, which is, is not so far from the, the actual situation, is is one where we think of the the different possibilities that that we're concerned with here um, as um, the. The, ti the, the times that, that it could be, let's say in hours and minutes, right? Um, and um, so, so, and then, you know, a, a, and so you're just, look, you're just looking at it from a certain distance, you know, you, and your, your eyesight is not perfect and so on. So, and you're, you're trying to, to judge the time. Um, and, um, and so, and let's suppose, you know, again, this seems like a, a, not a, a really dangerous uh, assumption that, that your, uh, your powers to judge the time don't depend on, on exactly where it's pointing. I mean, that, that, that you're, they're kind of equally good all, all around the, the circle. Uh, um, and, uh, and so, so if we're thinking of the relevant worlds as the worlds, you know, just given by the what the time actually is, and um, 
let's just let's assume that the clock it, it's perfectly accurate we're not worried about the inaccuracy in the clock we're just worried about difficulty of estimating where it's pointing um, then the accessibility relation is going to um, it, it's going to be we can as well, the worlds are the in effect we can ident simply identify with with points on the circumference and the the accessible worlds will be a little interval around the the actual world. So if if the let's suppose that the time was actually the, the actual time was let's say um, I don't know two o eight or something, then it might be that the accessible worlds would be suppose suppose that that, that you're accurate only up to five minutes. So that would mean in effect that if the actual time was there, then the accessible what times would be the interval from from 203 to 213 okay um, and I'm, I'm assuming that um, you know that it's five as well you, you you're accurate to within five minutes either way um, and um, and so so if you so from so this accessibility relation, it holds between um, 208 and, let's say, uh, 212, right? And, um, and it also holds uh, so th from bet between 212 and 216, right? Because it's, it, they're both, each of these is, is within the five-minute range. But it... it um, it does not hold between 208 and 216. Okay, because that's the gap there is. So if you, if 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 you roughly speak, what they're saying is, is saying is if the, the the time is 208, you do know that it's not 216 because you can you know that's that's above your five minute threshold, and. So this is kind of jumping ahead, but it's, it's fine to discuss it now. So what this means is that the, the accessibility relation is non-transitive. But in these, in these models, non-transitivity corresponds to the, the, um, the failure of the KK principle. Right? So that um, it... What this tells us is that in this model, there are things that you know, but that you don't know that you know. Right. And, and in, effect, in effect, if you're at 2.08, uh, you, you know that the time is between 2.03 and 2.13, but you don't know that you know that the time is between 2.03 and 2.13. So, of course, not, not everybody accepts these models. If you've been trained at, at MIT, you've been trained uh, to reject <laughs> uh, these, these, this particular type of model. But, um, but what, we're, what we're getting out of the idealization is that if we just start off by thinking about this, a very mundane phenomenon of... Um, Perceptual indiscriminability, you know, that, that, that you know, our powers of perceptual discrimination are limited. Then, simply by taking by taking you know a, a formal model of that, which is which corresponds quite you know in a quite a, a, a perspicuous way to, to those limitations, we already get you know a a quite striking epistemological result of you know knowing without knowing that you know. Um, and, and we get it not, because, you know, not out of sort of boring cases where you know, but you've never thought about whether you know, so you don't, but out of cases where, where you're just not, you're not in a position to know that you know, but you are in a position to know. And so th that's, that's an example um, of the, the kind of uh, thing that, uh, that, that we can do with these models. Um, so again, I'm, I'm now jumping ahead a bit, but, but something that's worth mentioning is that in the, in the period 
after Hintiker wrote, where epistemologists were mostly just ignoring Hintiker's work, um, it's quite striking that, that his work was taken up by people in theoretical economics and computer science. Um, and um, and they, they put it uh, to work. Um, and, and the kind of thing that they were interested in, well, in, in theoretical economics, um, people are very, they're, they're very interested in notions like common knowledge, where it's not just that everybody knows something, but everybody knows that everybody knows, and everybody knows that everybody knows that everybody knows, and so on. And, and those notions are, are important because um, in, in all sorts of um, decision theoretic examples and you know, examples in game theory which economists use to model various kinds of situation, it, or how, peop how people make decisions, I mean how people make rational decisions, uh, well you know, not surprisingly it doesn't just depend on what you know but it, on what you know about what everybody knows and what uh, you know about what everybody knows about what everybody knows and so on. And, um, those, you know, if we just try to do those in natural language, the reasoning becomes uh, incredibly complicated very, very quickly. So that we can, hard, it's really hard even to make, you know, if you start just looking at sentences like John knows that Mary knows that John knows that Mary knows that John knows that Mary knows that it's her birthday or whatever it is, the, you know, the, the, those are extremely hard to process and to do anything with. But uh, once you have these kind of models, in fact, um, in these applications for economics and com we'll start with those, you, really what you, you have to do, uh, uh, you have to have uh, different accessibility relations for each agent. I mean, each agent has their, their own RK, so it would have to be something like RK, you know, A, where A is the agent. And, uh, and so if you have 10 agents, you have to have 10 uh, knowledge accessibility uh, relations. And, um, and so these hard-headed economists who were, you know, who, they're not interested in epistemology for its own sake, but, but they find that epistemology, um, I mean, th th these epistemic models gave them exactly what they needed in order to reason about these uh, cases, which are otherwise just so complicated and confusing that, that, they're, that they're very hard to, to make any progress with. And, um, and it turns out that uh, in, in computer science, uh, there, are, there are applications which you know, are not so unlike the applications um, in, um, in economics, because um, you, particularly, for example, when, when you're running uh, concurrent programs, so you've got, you've got a computer which is, or, or maybe a, a, a network of computers, which are running several programs simultaneously. And, and they, they need to be, as it were, interacting with each other and giving you know, each other information about how far they've got with a certain process. And it, it turns out that there are all, all sorts of cases where, you know, for, for purposes of controlling um, you know, concurrent programming, you, you want to have the different, as it were, different computers or different you know, processes, um, knowing what's happening, things about what the other ones are doing, um, it, you know, in some sense of knowing. And, um, and again, it, it turns out that this is exactly the, the framework that you need for this. So, that, um, so the usefulness of this framework is, is not something that, that really requires philosophical defense in that case, because a whole lot of people you know, who are uh, under zero pressure to, 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 to use it um, it, in fact, find it very, very helpful. I mean, they, and the, uh, what I'm concerned with is kind of bringing it home to, uh, to epistemology uh, itself and, uh, and, and using it where it originated, uh, as with Hentika. So, so that's, that, that's just a, an, an example. And just, and just to give you another example of, of something, something that I've been concerned with very recently. Um, so there's been a lot of talk in, um, in epistemology about, recently about the principle that 
evidence of evidence is evidence. So, you know, if, if, if you have evidence that somebody else has evidence, then that's of, for, for some hypothesis. That's kind of, seems like kind of evidence for you that, in favor of the hypothesis, even though it's indirect. And, um, and so, and I've been interested in, uh, in exploring whether those principles hold universally, even in the case where you have evidence about your own evidence. Uh, you know, if, if you have evidence that you have evidence that a hypothesis holds, does, that, does it follow that you have evidence that the hypothesis holds? Um, and as you can see, I mean, these are, these are extremely tricky principles to think about. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, my view is you, if you just try to think about them I, I, in terms of examples and in a kind of uh, informal way, it's, it, it's, it, it's hard to make any kind of serious progress because it's also confusing that it's very hard to work out whether you're reasoning correctly and interpreting the examples correctly. But, but once you start modeling it formally, that then you can, you can see how these these examples uh, play, play out. Um, and, you know, in, well, in, in that particular case, the log logical omniscience um, is, is, isn't so, so bad because, um, you know, if, for example, if P entails Q and, and your evidence um, makes P probable, then your evidence does in fact make Q probable, even if you're not aware of the fact. So, so that in, in some of these applications, the logical omniscience is not, it's not really at all a kind of alien uh, assumption. Um, I'm not saying that, that, that all other methods should be completely abandoned and, you know, and of course, there's, you know, as in natural science, there's, there's always a lot to be discussed about whether a particular model is good and whether, whether there could be a better model and, and so on. But um, it, it seems it's, that it's very hard to make any kind of solid progress w without them on these trickier questions. And, and we do know how to make quite a lot of, of progress with the, <laughs> these models. So that um, you know, they, they, really, they really do come in useful. And, you know, I'll, and I'll give you some examples uh, later about how they're related to, to, to you know, very traditional f philosophical uh, concern, uh, concerns about skepticism and so on as, as well. So it's not, it's not just with these uh, kind of super complex cases that, that we need them. Um, uh, I think maybe maybe it's time to take a, 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 a five-minute break, okay. uh, and, Great. <laughs> and then we can continue. <laughs> we were just talking about the the knowledge aspect of um, of these models, and of course the the most the most striking difference between knowledge and belief uh, is that that knowledge uh, entails uh, truth. And uh, that um, belief doesn't. So, in the case of knowledge, what we want is that that whenever you know p, then p is true, which we can we can just represent uh, like that. And it turns out that the uh, that the the constraint on the knowledge um, accessibility relation that we need to achieve that is just that it's reflexive, that, uh, that every world is epistemically accessible from itself. And that, that, that corresponds in a very natural way because, remember, we, we explicated the epistemic accessibility relation by saying that X is epistemically accessible from W just in case everything that one knows at W is true at um, X. And therefore, since since knowledge is, is factive in this sense, everything that one knows at W will be true at W, and that means that W is epistemically accessible uh, from itself. Um, and, and then w w when we start um, modeling belief as well, we need a different um, accessibility relation from, from belief, uh, which I'm calling RB, where, which is explained in the same way as the, the one for knowledge, except that the, the, the requirement is not that everything that 
uh, for accessibility. It's, it's, it's not that everything that you know at W be true at X, but everything that you believe at W be true at X. And, um, and of course, um, we, we don't want reflexivity in general for the belief relation because you could have false beliefs. And uh, it, when you have a false belief, it is not, it, it, supposing it a world W, you have a false belief, then um, it's not the case that everything that you believe at W is true at W. And so um, the, the, the belief access, I mean, the doxastic accessibility relation uh, will, um, will divide all the worlds very naturally into those which are acce doxastically accessible from themselves and those which are not. The, do the ones which are doxastically accessible from themselves are uh, ones uh, where uh, all your beliefs are true, and the other ones are ones where you have at least one uh, false uh, belief. There's a weaker uh, condition, which is very, very often imposed, uh, I mean, structural condition on the uh, doxastic accessibility uh, relation, which is that it should be serial. In other words, that um, for every world W, there's a world X, such that... Um, the doxastic accessibility relation uh, holds from W to X. So in other words, w w what this requires is not that all your beliefs be true at the world that you're in, but that there should be at least one belief of which collectively all... Sorry, there should be at least one world such that collectively all your beliefs are true of that world, which is basically just equivalent to, um, to consistency. Uh, that you're, although your beliefs don't all ha may not all be true, they should at least be consistent uh, with each other. Um, and, and so consistency is, well, there are different ways you can put it, but, but one way of putting it is just that, oh, sorry, that, what that's saying is that I mean, the, the, the empty set, this, this is the empty set. Uh, the empty set is a contradiction. And the, so the, it's, this is just saying that the, the set of worlds in which you believe a contradiction is the empty set. In other words, there are no worlds where you believe a contradiction. And um, I mean, the thing is, within these models, because of the structural, the structural definition for, for what it is to believe is, is exactly parallel to that for, um, for knowledge. Uh, it, it's just the only difference is that you use the, the doxastic accessibility relation rather than the epistemic accessibility relation. But all the logical omniscience comes from the structure. It doesn't, it does, the logical omniscience has got nothing particular to do with, with this, the reflexivity constraint. So logical omniscience applies just as much to um, to belief as to, to knowledge. And, um, and so in, you know, in a world where you have inconsistent beliefs, it turns out that you believe everything because everything follows from a contradiction. And, and so that seems like uh, when we're kind of not really interested in, in cases where you just end up believing everything because then your beliefs are, t are totally uh, indiscriminate. Um, and so th this, this, given the logical omniscience for belief, this is just equivalent to saying that if you believe P, then, um, then you don't believe not P. I mean, th you need some, some features of logical omniscience for belief to, to get these equivalent, but given logical omniscience, they are. Um, <laughs> So, so you have these features. I, I mean, th there are lots of lots of different uh, principles involving both knowledge and belief that we could uh, discuss. I mean, a very simple one that I mentioned on the handout is that if you know something, you believe it, and and what that re requires on the um, in the models is just that the. Um, the belief, the doxastic accessibility 
relation should be um, a subset of the um, knowledge access, the epistemic accessibility uh, relation. And that, the reason for that is that um, if if you know, well, let's put it starting from from this that. Um, If something is um, implied, if, if, you, if you know something, then it's true in all the, the um, Yeah, sorry. If, if you know something, then it's true in, in all the epistemically accessible um, worlds. But the, the doxastically accessible worlds are a subset of the epistemically accessible worlds, and therefore it's true in all the doxastically accessible worlds. So that's, that's why it, these things uh, correspond. Um, since I, I want to focus on some of the, the key kind of idealizations that have been made in these models, um, I want to uh, focus on the two which there's been a lot of controversy uh, about. Which w One of them is the one that I've already mentioned, the KK principle, which corresponds to the... And, and I'll, I'll, I'll consider these for, for knowledge rather than belief, although th there are somewhat similar issues about belief. Um, so the, the, the KK principle, which is, corresponds, if you know some modal logic, it corresponds to the S4 uh, axiom for modal logic. And that corresponds to the transitivity of the um, epistemic accessibility uh, relation. Um, there's, so that's, remember, that's if you know something, then you know that you know it. That's, that's, that's also known as positive introspection. I mean, these are not terribly good names, but, they, but they, they're fairly standard. There's also a principle uh, called uh, negative introspection, um, which is a principle if, the, if you don't know something, then you know that you uh, don't know it. And, and that corresponds to a, a less known, um, I'm less familiar um, feature of relations, which is called being uh, Euclidean. Um, so th this, this holds just in case the, the knowledge, the, the epistemic accessibility relation has this Euclidean property. And the Euclidean property says that if you've got a world W and there are worlds um, X and Y, which are both accessible from W, then, um, then Y will also be accessible from X, so that you can, as it were, complete the, uh, the diagram in, in, that, in that way. Um, but it, it, it turns out that if you have a reflexive relation corresponding to knowledge being factive, which is also transitive and Euclidean, that's equivalent to uh, having a um, a relation which is an equivalence relation in the sense of being um, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. And um, equivalence, equivalence relations are, are really nice because what they, what they in effect do is they, they partition the, the domain, whatever it is, but here the domain of worlds, they partition it into a number of uh, non-overlapping um, sets such that uh, every member of the domain, every world, belongs to exactly one of these sets. Um, and, um, and so the picture of model, of the, the, the picture of knowledge that you get uh, if, if you have um, 
not knowledge being satisfying both the positive and negative introspection principles is a very simple satisfying one that's easy to work with where um, there are there are basically lots all these partition classes and the worlds in them are um, indistingu completely indistinguishable from the point of the knower so that you know if, if you're at a world say in that class or basically what you know is that you're somewhere in um, in this uh, partition class but you you have no idea which of the which of those the, the worlds in that class you're in and um, and and you don't you don't get any features like uh, like indiscriminability where as it were um, with, with the non-transitivity of indiscriminability and in um, theoretical economics and computer science in, in the applications that have been made of epistemic logic they've generally assumed both negative and positive uh, introspection um, and, and so been able to work with these kind of partitional no models of, uh, of knowledge. Um, and and that's, that's simplified things for them a, a lot. But for reasons that were already pointed out by Hintika in his book, there's, there's something um, especially strikingly uh, Im implausible about the negative introspection principle that if you don't know then you know that you don't know um, I mean Hintika was was much more positive about the positive introspection principle the KK principle which as I mentioned I've, I have my objections to but 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 he, I mean Hintika pointed out that um, that there are all sorts of very very straightforward cases where the negative introspection seems to fail and uh, so these are, these are basically fairly straightforward cases of error, right? So that suppose that, um, I, you know, I think that, um, let's say, I'm supposing I think that my, my keys are in my jacket, but I'm wrong about that, okay? So since, since I'm wrong about it, uh, so, so let's let's say that let's call that proposition that my keys are in my jacket. Let's call it just jacket. Um, so since jacket, I mean, so the proposition, I mean, my keys are in fact somewhere else. So jacket is false. So that means that I, it's not the case that I know jacket because you can't know what's false. But I, of course, think I know jacket. I mean, you know, I, I have no reason to suspect that, any, that there's anything problematic going on. So I think I know jacket. So since I think I know jacket, um, I, I don't believe that I don't, it's, I, I don't believe that I don't know jacket because I believe that I do know jacket. And, I, and in this matter, my beliefs are perfectly consistent. Um, so, um, so, for, so for all I believe, I know, I know jacket, and um, and therefore I, it's not the case that I know that I don't know jacket. Sorry, this is meant to be jacket here. So. I don't know jacket, but I also don't know that I don't know jacket. And that's, that is automatically, that's a counterexample to negative introspection, uh, which doesn't involve anything very complex at all. It, it just involves <laughs> error. <laughs> um, and, you know, er error of the most straightforward kind where, where I, think I, I think I know, but, I, but in fact I don't know. Um, and, and so there's something a bit, crazy um, that's, that's going uh, on here. And um, this, this is actually related to, um, as I think I promised I would say, uh, to issues about skepticism. Um, because 
although the, the case of Jacket is just a completely or, just ordinary uh, error, it, it has some, um, some crucial structural aspects in common with skeptical scenarios, including skeptical scenarios of the most radical uh, kind, like you know, brains and vats and, and so on, where, where you have a, um, an asymmetry between what I call the good case where, and the good, so the good case, it can be the case, you know, where um, you're, you're per perceiving the external world and so on. But it can also just, it could also just be the case where you, where you know, I know that that my uh, my uh, keys are in my jacket, and um, and the bad case, and the bad case is is the error case where you know I'm a brain in a vat, or or just where my keys are, are not where I think they are. Um, and you know, if we if we fill in the um, epistemic accessibility relation, well, of course we know it's going to be reflexive. So uh, each each of these two worlds is accessible from itself. But the key thing is that if you're in the bad case, for all you know, you're in the good case. You know, if if my key, you know, if I'm wrong about my, where my keys are, but for, for all I know, I I actually know where they are. So that so that for all I know, I'm in the good case. But if I'm in the, in the good case, I, by implication, I know that I'm not in the bad case because uh, I know that my keys are in my jacket. And the bad case is a case where the, uh, my uh, keys are, are not in my jacket. So, so the key aspect here is the good case is accessible from the bad case, but the bad case is not accessible from the good case. And um, and, and that means that uh, epistemic accessibility is non-symmetric. Whereas in these partitional models uh, of, um, of knowledge that, that are used in applications in theoretical economics and computer science, the, the accessibility relation is a, um, an equivalence relation. Now, uh, you know, I think one, one interesting thing that's going on here is that for the modeling purposes that the economists and computer scientists were interested in, I think that the idealization that they were making, in which they ignored um, the ways in which uh, it, the negative introspection principle can fail, was a, was a perfectly reasonable idealization. And I mean, the reason why it was it was okay, is because what they were really fundamentally interested in understanding was um, inter-agent phenomena, um, where you know it might be, for example, that the, all the relevant agents, whether these were economic agents or or different programs or however you like to think of them, uh, different processes that are going on in a computer, um, where they might all know something, but not all know that they all know it. And, and this can have all sorts of crucial uh, effects uh, of, of interest. And, and so, so this had to do with agents' ignorance about the, the knowledge of other agents. And, you know, and I think... It, for the same kind of reason as I was saying that it, it, it makes sense to um, assume logical omniscience in order to study the effects of perceptual limitations. It, it makes sense to, to have agents who, as it were, in the relevant sense, have perfect uh, introspection, uh, who know themselves perfectly, in, in order just to focus on... Um, uh, limitations to knowledge that come from failures of communication amongst the agents. So I think for the, the limited purposes for which these applications were intended, it was a perfectly good modeling assumption to, to hold that both uh, positive and negative introspection uh, held. Um, of course, in the long run, it would also be interesting to, to think about uh, how those those phenomena might 
evolve new complexities once the agents did not have perfect uh, introspection. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people involved in those traditions did not simply regard negative and positive introspection um, as modeling assumptions that were useful idealizations for a particular purpose, but they, they kind of hardened them into dogmas and um, were surprisingly unable to understand what the considerations were that make them inappropriate as general assumptions. Um, and I mean that's and that is something that I think we, we, there's been quite a lot of in the evolution of the modeling methodology that um, that people have often had this tendency to uh, to treat um, good modeling assumptions as um, as dogma um, and it's particularly understandable um, in cases like this one where um, the mathematics does become a bit harder uh, once, once you drop these assumptions because it, the mathematics tends to work out in very straightforward ways uh, w w when, when you have an, an, excess, uh, an epistemic accessibility that's a relation that's, that's an equivalence relation that gives you this nice partition. But I mean, it's not as, it's not as though that the mathematics is totally intractable if, if you drop that assumption. It's just a bit harder, but, but I mean, you know, we can do some slightly harder maths. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that, um, that we, we just have to be aware of uh, the ways uh, in which certain idealizations are, are good for some purposes and bad for others. And, and in particular, once we start bringing home the, these epistemic doxastic models into um, mainstream epistemology, where a lot of the focus is just on um, the single agent uh, case, uh, th then uh, negative and positive introspection are much, much more problematic principles that we absolutely should not just be um, trying to, uh, to build into models by, by fiat, that we, we have to take um, the challenges to them seriously. And uh, I mean, in, in the case of uh, Positive introspection, it's more controversial, but I think in the case of, of uh, although I think it does uh, fail for the kind of reason I gave, but in the case of negative introspection, I think it's totally clear that it fails. Um, um, and uh, that it's, if you would, I mean, the only way really of holding on to negative introspection is by becoming a skeptic. But, um, Sorry. yes. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I heard the reason for rejecting negative introspection, but you said that you gave a reason also to reject positive yes, introspection. Yes, well, that, that was when I was talking about the unmarked clock. I mean, about, uh, oh, about I the, the, the uh, non-transitivity okay. of okay. conceptual indiscriminability. But, um. Okay, so shall we, yeah, yeah. Carlotta. Oh, wait, wait. I was a little so, so this is a substantial point. So you you were equating uh, the KK role in, uh, for example, models of common knowledge to uh, the idealization that uh, you know you, you know all the tautologies uh, in the models where transitivity is not doesn't hold, right? So you were saying, look, um, just like. Uh, in my models for sexual discriminations, uh, you know, we can forget about uh, problems of logical omniscience and idealize yes. away of those, um, and we can get, but, but, and that allows us to focus on what is important here, yes. which is, uh, similarly, you were saying, well, uh, KK has a similar role to uh, in, in models, for example, common knowledge, where, yes. where you know, people use KK uh, models yeah. uh, and that's very, but I was thinking, you know, it's a little surprising to me because it seems to me that they're playing different roles. Uh, so it's very hard to, so it seems like KK uh, principles can actually explain how common knowledge arises. That's, it's not just an organization that it's convenient to, um, to hold fix uh, for Stonecker, yes. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a principle that, by which you can actually derive how agents 
get to know, commonly know, in a, in a conversation, right? Uh, we, but you need much more than KK. I mean, it's not... It's yeah, not, it's not just KK, it's, but it, it you, you need KK, right? Yes. Yes. Whereas in your, in, your, in your case, you don't actually need uh, logical omniscience. It's just something that the model uh, is built in the model that you're using to highlight uh, the issue of perceptual discrimination and f failures of KK. And that's fine, but it doesn't play a role in uh, really in... Uh, you know, how th you're thinking about propositions, uh, whether they're cross-grained or not, doesn't really play a role. So it seems to me that there's a kind of this analogy in the two sorts of idealizations. Um, yeah, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not so sure I, 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 about that. I mean, I mean what, what, well, there's one kind of disanalogy, which is just that um, in, the case, uh, in the case of KK, um, it, it's it's very clear how to build models in which it fails. In, in the case of logical omniscience, uh, I mean, you, you can build models in which it fails, but, but that we have to, uh, they get extremely complicated very quickly, right. and, uh, and it's, it's, it's not clear that, that, um, that, w that, in fact, that they have very much, um, that they're very much used to a lot of these, these models in which it, it, it fails because, uh, you have to write in so many of the consequences of what you want by hand that, yeah. that, that they're, not really, they're not doing very much work. But, uh, but on the more specific asymmetry that you were suggesting, I mean, it's, I mean, it's certainly true that, that, that if in situations in which KK fails, you're also not going to get common knowledge because... Uh, so that uh, in because if you d if you don't well if you if you know that everybody knows something that, that involves knowing that you know something and and so on through various iterations, um, but but it's not really the KK that's explaining why the common knowledge holds. It's uh, it's just KK. It, is um, an, an, off, an offshoot of, of something else that explains why common knowledge holds. Uh, because, I mean, because, you know, as you know, you can have lots of agents, all of whom satisfy in, in introspection, and they all know things, but they don't all know that they all, all know them. Um, and in the case of um, the... Of perceptual indiscriminability, um, th there is a kind of connection between um, the logical omniscience and um, and the failure of uh, KK. Although I mean, not not a, t not a, a totally d direct one, but if you, but if you if you look, for example, at I mean. For example, in the, in, in, in the stuff I have on inexact knowledge, there are, there are places where I, I give a, a direct argument for the failure of KK that, that doesn't involve epistemic models or anything, I mean, at all. Um, but in that direct argument, I, I have to make some assumptions about, about at least about the local closure of of knowledge under certain um, logical consequences, um, because the, the the argument, I mean, the argument wouldn't wouldn't work with uh, without it. So um, it's, I mean, I think. So it's it's not that it plays no role at all. I think what's true is that that um, you can have failures of uh, KK without failures of uh, of. Sorry, you, I mean that 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 you don't you don't require logical consequence for there to be the failures of KK, but um, I mean you, you could have those in the presence of uh, lots of failures of logical omniscience, although it's a bit it's a bit trickier to to argue for. But um, so 
So, I mean, there are some subtle asymmetries, but I, I don't think the difference is that, is that great. <laughs> yeah. Would you like to finish your... Okay, well, why don't, why don't I just... Uh, I'll, I'll just say don't. the last things that, I, that I have to uh, say, which, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and then let's hope we have some time for some uh, discussion. I, so I want to say something um, now about the kind of positive contribution that... Um, I think the, the model building methodology can have in mainstream epistemology. I mean, I think in a way the, the, the discussions of negative and positive introspection already involve issues w which are of, of obvious interest from the point of view of mainstream epistemology. But I, I, I think there's also a way in which the, the model building methodology can contribute to repairing um, certain inadequacies in the current methodology for it as, were, as used for the purposes for which it, it currently is used in mainstream methodology. And in particular, you know, if you think about the, the, the kind of standard method in a lot of mainstream uh, epistemology of r roughly speaking con uh, kind of Popperian conjectures and refutations where people for put forward proposed analyses and proposed hypotheses, and then they test them by, um, by making, um, by doing thought experiments and seeing if they can provide counterexamples to, to these uh, proposals. Um, and um, and then if 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 they if they find a counterexample then they throw out the the conjecture and if they don't find a counterexample after trying for a while then the conjecture is well this is a slight, slightly non popperian bit is regarded as having you know having been to some extent confirmed um, so it's not pure falsificationism um, one way in which it seems to me that this uh, methodology is rather naive is that it's what some people have called error fragile in the sense that it it's very vulnerable to to error it, it, that if we make an error then and, and it's not so much that we're very liable to make errors is that if we do make errors things are going to go really badly wrong um, bec and that's because um, you, you know, it, it's possible to have errors of falsification, cases where you, you, you think that you have a counterexample, but it's not really a counterexample because in some way you've misjudged it. And of course that, that can happen in science because you do uh, an experiment wrong. And the, as a, at least on the kind of simple version of Popper's methodology, there isn't really you know, a, a proper account of, of how that, that is uh, taken care of because falsification is not as as it were cut and dried and once for all, uh, as uh, Popper suggests it, because you know, an experiment can be done wrong. But it's also the case that a thought experiment can be done wrong. I mean, done wrong in the sense that our verdict on a thought experiment can be mistaken. And I'm not, I'm not saying this out of any general hostility uh, to um, the, the use of thought experiments, which it seems to me can often be very uh, illuminating. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I don't think much of the uh, experimental philosopher's uh, negative program of um, arguing that there's something systematically uh, uh, wrong with the thought experimentation. In fact, I think the evidence is coming in that, that the, the sorts of eth ethnic and gender differences that, that they were claiming have, you know, have turned out not, not on the whole to uh, to be repeated when the experiments were redone um, more carefully, uh, but nevertheless, thought experimentation is it's a it's a human method, and like like all human methods, it, it's uh, subject to uh, to error. That we can we can do thought experiments wrong. We can, for one reason or another, 
um, misjudge what's going on in a thought experiment and give the wrong answer. And if we're just using this kind of falsificationist methodology where one thought experiment uh, is enough to eliminate a, uh, a conjecture from uh, further um, consideration, then you know, it could be that we eliminate the true theory uh, as a result of misjudging a thought experiment by giving the wrong verdict for whatever uh, reason happens to be. But, uh, but, but w w what we cannot really afford is a methodology that's error fragile in this sense, so that, uh, as a word, that there's no recovery from error. Uh, we, we need to have a, a kind of methodology which is, which is more uh, robust uh, than that. And, and I think w one, one way in which we can make our methodology more robust is, is by not simply relying on um, thought experiments and that, that kind of naive falsificationism, but also by, by using uh, thought experiments, uh, oh, sorry, by using um, formal modeling as an alternative way of understanding what's going on in uh, debates in, uh, in mainstream epistemology. And so, for example, one, one thing that I've done, I'm not, I'm not going to go into it today, is um, I looked at how, how we might consider Gettier cases within uh, formal models to, to, as it were, to look to, to see whether um, on formal grounds we, we, we would predict that Gettier cases would arise. I mean, for, for, for those purposes, we need something a bit more elaborate than I've given here because we also need to, to be able to model justification um, of, of the kind of non-factive kind that is concerned in uh, Gettier cases. Um, within these formal models. But that can be done. And I think, I think once you do it, you see that, that actually, um, you, just on formal grounds, you'd expect there to be Gettier cases. In fact, you'd expect there to be um, Gettier cases of different kinds, some of them corresponding to something like the fake Barnes cases, uh, and something corresponding to more like the, um, the traditional uh, Gettier cases, which, which, I mean, the difference between the two is, is um, that the, the traditional sort of Gettier cases, I mean, the original kind, they involve an agent who has justified false beliefs as well as justified true beliefs. And that's, and that's critical in how you generate these uh, the Gettier cases. Whereas with fake Barnes cases, um, you can have uh, Gettier cases where you, we, we, they can arise, well, they, where they do arise, even though all the agents' justified beliefs are true. And, uh, you know, and it, it looks, you know, if you think about this from a formal point of view, it looks as though you'd expect there to be both kinds of Gettier case. Um, and, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting that the modeling uh, approach uh, is, is infallible uh, either. Um, I think it, it's, you know, it too uh, is, is subject to, to various possibilities of uh, error. It's just that if, if, we, if we've got a methodology which, is, which involves both the use of thought experiments and the use of, um, of formal models, and then, and then we can see them that converging on the same answer to various questions, that is a, a, a more robust kind of methodology. Uh, than we get by putting all our eggs in one basket and by only using uh, thought experiments or uh, only using um, formal models. And just to, to finally to say one or two things about what the, um, the modeling methodology is like in practice and how, how it, you know, it can make a difference to our kind of intellectual uh, habits. Uh, w one thing that really uh, struck me in, uh, in discussing it, w I mean, I, I w was, what really forced me to think about modeling methodology seriously was doing some, uh, some joint uh, research with a theoretical economist uh, now at Princeton, Hyunsong Hyun uh, Shin. Um, and, 
who's, you know, who's actually quite philosophically sophisticated as, as, as well as being a, a very good uh, theoretical economist. But um, w w one thing that really struck me was I was talking to him about the, uh, the, the Gettier case, and, and he was saying, yeah, well, in, in economics, uh, Gettier's paper wouldn't really have been considered publishable. Um, and, um, and, you know, and the reason for that is that if, you, if you're following a, 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 um, a, a model building methodology, you expect that models will diverge you know, very, very palpably from reality. Um, and, and, th and the response, um, you know, there's, there's no, there are no particular rewards for just pointing out what's c considered to be uh, obvious. I mean, the, w what people are looking for is not, you know, someone just negatively pointing out that the model is different from reality because that was taken for granted all along. Uh, but somebody uh, producing a better model, what one which, uh, retains the insights of the original model, uh, but also um, gives us further insights that, that, as it were, corresponds somewhat better than the first model uh, to uh, the reality that we're uh, interested in. And of course, this is it's kind of un, I mean, unfair to, to Gettier to, to, to say this, because um, the, the, the people that he was um, Criticizing, I mean, the, the, the analysis that he was criticizing in his paper was was not put, put, put forward as a model. It was put forward as an exceptionless uh, generalization, and uh, I mean, as providing necessary and sufficient conditions uh, for knowledge. And and so it was perfectly uh, appropriate, given the way it was put forward, to point out that there were in fact uh, exceptions uh, to it. Um, but if if we start doing more model building in, uh, in epistemology, then, then we've got to get used to the idea that, uh, that our methodology will not be as single-mindedly focused on counterexamples as it has been. I mean, you know, and, and of course, one's, uh, you know, as a philosopher, one's an, an initial an, an, and it, I mean, reaction to that is, is likely to be, but you know, don't these people care about truth? Um, but of course, you know, the, the, the model building methodology is, is just as consistent with um, you know, a, a truth-oriented um, kind of research as the, the, the falsificationist one. It's just that the approach is a more indirect one. In both cases, what we're trying to do is to you know, understand a, a subject uh, matter uh, and to reach knowledge, in, in, in effect, about the, the subject matter. It's just that with the model building methodology, what we're doing is treating the subject matter as sufficiently complicated and messy and tricky that our best ways of understanding it may, in many cases, involve um, modeling it and, um, and then trying to understand the model, um, rather than just directly trying to put forward exceptionless generalizations about the, the phenomenon. And, you know, and I think one can even say a bit about what kind of uh, knowledge that we can gain by, by studying models. I mean, some of the, the knowledge is, is simply mathematical knowledge of the models themselves, about how they work. Um, and you know, th that's as secure as other kinds of mathematical uh, knowledge. And of, in fact, rel mostly it's relatively elementary uh, mathematics that's uh, involved. Um, but of course, it, if it was just mathematical n knowledge, that wouldn't be very much because that wouldn't have any special bearing on the phenomena that we're actually interested in. But I think uh, the other thing that you can get by, um, by studying uh, these m models and comparing them to what you're interested in is some rather kind of vague knowledge, but still knowledge of the, you know, of the form that, uh, that these, no these models uh, reveals something about how such and such phenomena work, 
um, and that some of, some of these models are better than others at um, analyzing what's going on in such cases and so on. And, uh, um, and that kind of knowledge that we're gaining from the models is the same kind of knowledge as um, natural scientists can gain of the phenomena that they're interested in uh, by modeling. So uh, it, you know, it, seems, it seems to me that there's in maybe what seemed like initially rather counterintuitive ways, uh, we, we, may, um, we, we may have to revise our methodological habits, at least for some purposes, more than we might expect in, in following this model building methodology. But I think it's got, a, there are also a lot of uh, potential uh, rewards and I think for sure there's a, there are lots of ways that it can be applied in epistemology as well as in other branches of philosophy um, where it hasn't yet been because people haven't yet been uh, sufficiently alert to uh, what can be done with this kind of uh, methodology. And uh, I mean, one nice thing about it is that, you know, a kind of assumption it's easy to, to fall into is that um, in, in research, uh, rigor and pleasure are opposed principles. Um, but actually, that's a rather naive uh, view. And you know, if you just think about the way in which uh, play and, uh, has cognitive uh, value, um, w w one thing that we're often doing with these models is basically playing with them. I mean, seeing what, seeing what they do, seeing how if you twiddle one bit in the model, uh, w things work differently. And um, you know, so it's like, it's like playing with a construction set. Um, and uh, and so, you know, it, it's on the one hand, we, this, this is a way that we can bring a, a certain level of m mathematical rigor to thinking about these matters. And on the other hand, in in which uh, play can uh, constitute uh, research. And so, it, it's nice to be able to do two at the, both at the same time. Right, thanks. <laughs> So, it's time for questions. Okay, someone will um, <clears throat> Thank you for your talk. Um, could you say something more on how to formalize the notion of um, justification in epistemic logics? Uh, I think that uh, one of the reasons why some mainstream epistemologists are suspicious of epistemic logic is that uh, they think that uh, uh, these formal systems are ultimately unable to um, reach the level of complexity required to properly formalize knowledge. What, what do you think about it? Um, well, I, I think it's it's not a question of whether one can formalize uh, knowledge, but, uh, because in a way, uh, w what we're doing here is just we're, um, you know, we're, speci we're specifying that 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 um, in these models, you, uh, one knows p if and only if this condition is, is met. So it's uh, it, it's not that uh, one isn't formalizing knowledge. It's simply that one's uh, discussing a, a situation um, in which um, knowledge works in, in a pretty, you know, a simplified way. Um, so where we're not dealing with all the complexities at, at once. Um, and, And of course, exactly the same thing can be done with, with justification as, as well. I mean, it's, it's now, um, so, so that the, I mean, the crucial methodological uh, decision is simply that, that we're going to, to look at these very simplified situations to see what, how things work there. And, you know, I mean, the, the, fact, the fact is that Mainstream epistemology 
has already made a kind of decision methodologically of that, of that sort in, you know, in the analytic tradition because, um, for example, you know, people pro generally prefer to talk about very, very simple examples of knowledge, but we, I mean, ones which they describe in informal terms. Um, and, you know, and, I mean, I think one, in some ways, rather uh, unfortunate um, result of the separation between, um, well, I would say mainstream philosophy and particularly epistemology and philosophy of science is that the people, uh, there's very little discussion of sort of rich e examples of, of scientific knowledge, which of course is actually, you know, w w I mean, a lot of, that's a lot of our best knowledge, but, but that is not what's discussed. And I think it's, uh, it's a little bit similar to the case in philosophy of language, where, where people have, have tended to focus on very simple uh, examples because we can, we can understand the, as well, the mechanisms involved in, in those. Um, you know, and w w one, I mean, one thing that's distinctive of um, analytic, uh, analytic philosophy of language I I is that the concentration on, on simple examples rather than rich literary texts, whereas if you think about philosophy of language outside the analytic tradition, the, the tendency is to concentrate on the richest examples of language rather than the most I impoverished. And, um, uh, you know, and I think you, you know, one can see the pros and, and cons. But, uh, so that it, it, you know, it's not as though um, analytic epistemology hasn't taken a, a, any decision uh, in, you know, of that general kind of you know, looking at simple cases rather than highly complex cases. But it, what it hasn't done is uh, is take you know a further step of looking you know at ones where which are described in these formal formal terms um, and um, and you know so I think that I mean if I mean if we're going to make progress we we do have to um, abstract from all sorts of complexity, because if we simply approach quest, uh, phenomena in, the, 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 as it were, the kind of multi-dimensional complexity that they have in the wild without any attempt to abstract from that, I think it's pretty clear that we're never going to make any serious progress. Okay, so just to, to understand, so I sympathize with the general methodology, uh, but um, just to get a little more guidance about what we should do. <laughs> so you were saying how, you know, if you're concerned with individual knowledge, then, um, or in perceptual discrimination, then uh, certain models are better than um, the ones that uh, people have yes. used for uh, uh, common knowledge, and you say, well, you know, uh, this model that fails transitivity is as good as any for individual knowledge, but then, and so models can become better in the sense that it can become more comprehensive for a bigger phenomenon, you know, just individual knowledge and common knowledge. Uh, so how, how do you go about, so I, I, I'm not sure if the analogy with, you know, science too, like it's, you know, uh, the tendency is to over-specialize uh, and try to capture very small phenomenon, and then the problem is how to expand those models to, to kind of be able to capture more comprehensive realities, right? So, um, so how, how do we go about doing that? What, what, you know, um, just because exactly like in conformity to your suggestion that we shouldn't just try to concoct counterexamples, um, uh, we should look at more systematic generalizations. And, you know, in the debate between you and Stolniker, it seems that, you know, Stolniker is looking at systematic considerations about the applicability of his models, you know, in computer science and um, in, our, in other areas of science that they don't, they don't just have to do with the human case. And uh, so that would be a consideration for saying, well, the way to expand the, the yes. model uh, to capture common knowledge is maybe to uh, um, consider uh, cases where transitivity fail as less important and try to explain them away. There will be one way, right? Uh, what's your suggested way? Yeah. Yeah. 
So, I, I mean, I, you know, I don't think that, the, uh, that there's a huge methodological gap between me and the, if you like, the MIT school, or the, if you like, the Oxford school and, and, and the, um, the MIT school. Um, I, I think that, well, uh, uh, insofar as we're concerned with um, the specific um, models and you know what what you need to put into the the models um, to to get uh, the right uh, effects um, I mean you know my my view is that the att attempts to uh, model um, perceptual uh, Knowledge, um, you know, and in particular, what I've called inexact knowledge, you know, in uh, in terms of um, of the kind of models where the the KK principle would hold. I, I mean, have have been pretty ad hoc, um, and that as it were that you, that you can that. They've just, it's not that the, the KK principle has been, um, you know, explained as an offshoot of really, uh, you know, in these, once we start to look at these perceptual cases in way, in, in, you know, in terms that, that look independently very natural, but, but by rather, um, by being kind of sort of bolted onto the, the models in, in a way. Um, and, um, and so that, that you know, to to some extent, we, we, you know, it's a matter of uh, you know what we regard as um, elegant and, and models, and what seem like are more in the way of kind of um, you know ad ad hoc, somewhat ramshackle uh, models built you know just in order to to get this one uh, principle, which is after all is not is not at all a. a, a a pre-theoretic data, more you know, just a, a phenomenon noticed uh, out there. Um, you know, but I, you know, I mean, I think that the, the, the appropriate way for, for that debate to go forward is just to, for each each side to keep you know to keep modelling away. And I think and I think in the long run, it, you know, it'll be pretty clear which, which uh, is the, the the more promising way of going. Um, I mean, there's a specific issue of common knowledge that you were uh, mentioning, which is. Um, we're common knowledge where, so this is where everybody knows and everybody knows that everybody knows and everybody knows that everybody knows and, uh, and, and what's, um, what's kind of alarming about, about this is um, that it seems that, that you, can't, you can't have common knowledge without people have, having um, of things, without people having infinitely many iterations of um, of self-knowledge about it, and knowing and knowing that you know, and knowing that you know that you know, and and so on, uh, ad uh, infinitum. And and it's certainly not as though um, it, it just feels as though that is what we do know. That we that it doesn't feel as though we have infinitely many uh, iterations of knowledge. On the other hand, uh, there are uh, there are cases where it seems uh, very natural to explain what's what's going on in you know kind of relatively realistic cases by postulating common knowledge and um, so and it, yeah it's, it's not as though common knowledge has to, the, the fact that you have common knowledge in certain cases it's not as though that implies that you have to have the KK principle universally it's just that it implies that that, that you can have I infinitely many iterations of knowledge even in these kind of in, you know empirical cases which is something that you wouldn't expect you know on the kind of models uh, on which uh, the KK principle fails so it's a slight you but I th you know I think um, I mean what, what so the, qu the question is whether um, when when common knowledge is postulated, it's got to be because common knowledge really does hold in these cases, uh, or, um, or or because it, common knowledge is um, 
is somehow a you know a reasonable approximation to what's being what what's going on and and I mean and it's a really interesting example because there are some theoretical ways in which in which although you might think that just having a you know some you know six layers of of shared knowledge was enough I mean as you know I mean there are the various examples in which it turns out that 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 you get one sort of effect if you have infinitely many levels of, of shared knowledge and, 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 and things work differently if you only have finitely many knowledge. And so that's, you know, that's a, that is definitely an argument on the side of uh, taking common knowledge as it were at face value. But I, I think, I mean, people like Harvey Lederman have, you know, have done uh, work on uh, aiming to show that it, in fact the, uh, the phenomena that we're actually dealing with in the social sciences where people have postulated common knowledge can be understood on the basis of um, much less r rich um, descriptions uh, of what's going on, which don't require, uh, you know, lots of iterations. And, and, and that also seems, seems to me to be, you know, an, an area where um, it's where both sides need to be ex explored properly, and uh, where it may well take you know a while before it, the, the, the situation is is clear. But you know, I, I think I mean the thing is, I'm the yes. Is a kind of that so it made isolation. yes. So I mean, I, I think what, what, what I mean, my bet is that common knowledge is is an idealization and that it's and that what's really going on in this ca these cases where it seems natural to posit common knowledge is is actually much less than that but but i don't want to suggest that that's an easy option i mean you know i think that there are there are serious explanatory burdens on on saying that but, uh, uh, about how, so how specifically do you explain do you explain what's going on in these cases and um, you know, and I think that's that's an ongoing research program. You know, and and I think, in general, um, one one thing that a sort of model building methodology can push us towards is, you know, a, a somewhat more constructive methodology in in epistemology and elsewhere. Which, and I'm saying this as somebody who um, derives great pleasure from the destructive side of philosophy from you know kind of um you know doing my best to to destroy and obliterate theories that i don't like but actually uh, i think that, that there's a lot to be said for um a, a more constructive where, where, where as we each side is just trying to to provide the the best explanations uh, 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 you know of a maybe of a broadly model building kind of of what's going on in certain interesting cases and um and and then you know and so the and where to the extent that they're criticizing what the other side are doing these these are just challenges to 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 model things better in in some way and you know and i think that uh, that a reasonable hope is that by pursuing this kind of research pro program, in the end, th these matters become settled, and and it may, in some cases, it may even be that that we get a bit of convergence from the two the two sides, um, but, or but it may be that, in some cases, it's just that one research program runs into the ground because it, it simply can't model the the key features, and the other one it turns out can model them quite quite well, and 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 then that may end, end up being decisive. I have a question about counterexamples, uh, because you seem to be skeptical about those kind of attitudes. But for example, when you made jacket case, yes. this is a kind of counterexample. Yes. So it seems to me that this kind of modeling, in a way, has a way should be compared to some. Uh, evidential datum or some e example or counterexamples of which we can make. So it doesn't seem to me that doing modeling really can uh, uh, substitute a certain yes. way to do philosophy, but 
is should be uh, integrated with yes. it. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I, I mean, I, I love country examples. <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I love finding country examples, um, and. I mean, after all, what I was comparing counterexamples to were single experiments in science, and you know, and of course, it would be um, it would be ridiculous to to say that scientists should stop doing experiments because it's always possible to do an experiment wrong or something. I mean, it, but I, but I think it's it's rather that um, that we shouldn't we shouldn't think of these you know just on the model of um, you know, the sort of traditional philosophy of science model w w where somebody says all swans are white and then somebody produces a black swan and then that eliminates th that uh, conjecture and then, and then we can move on. But it, it has to be that, um, that w w all of this is, is taking place, um, you know, w within a... You know, a somewhat more th theoretical f framework where um, we, you know, we, we don't just regard single exper experiments as, you know, by themselves automatically eliminating hy hypotheses and and so on. And um, and you know, I, I'm where um, we, you know, we can see. You know, and it's better if, if you know, we, we can see on somewhat general grounds, you know, w w why a certain kind, type of counterexample would be expected to arise and, and, and that sort of thing. So, so it, it, it's, I'm not really, uh, you know, I, I'm not really anti counterexamples, but, but I think we just have to be careful about, as we're treating counterexamples counter as a matter of, you know, producing indubitable data that en that enable us automatically to eliminate generalizations um, once you know for, for all and, and never think about them again. Because although some, I mean, you know, in many in many cases the generalizations will indeed be <laughs> false, and, and we may know that they're false and as a result of this and so on. But but we do need a bit more than that. Um, you know, in, just in order um, to be able to reconsider cases w where we may we may have made a mistake w w with the um, with the counterexamples, um, and and so so we need we need as far as you know to have more converging consider considerations, just just as a way of ensuring that our re results are relatively robust and. Um, that, that, we're, that we haven't just uh, gone off in the wrong direction on the basis you know, of, of a single, uh, perhaps mistaken you know, thought experiment or something like that. Right. But what is, can be the, the test for the counterexamples? Because modeling is not a test for the counterexample, because we can obviously model the counterexample, but this doesn't, this doesn't seem to be relevant. Yeah. But, uh, so, I mean, the thing is, you know, in this particular case, um, the the counterexample is is a, an extremely elementary phenomenon, right? Um, and um, because it, it it's really just uh, the counterexample is one that we would expect as soon as we think of a case of a straightforward false belief. And then, and actually, um, a, a, a lo in this example, a, a lot of the, the counterexample, it just starts off you know, with, with a very simple description and then quite a lot of reasoning on the basis of, the, of, of that. Um, but, it, well, I mean, I mentioned in the case of, um, the, of, of Gettier, that, that it is possible to, uh, to to model well. What you could what you can do is is as a model the J, uh, JTB account. I mean you can, you can because you can have uh, you can think about models where um, you can uh, where you have you know one operator for 
uh, knowledge and one operator for justified uh, belief, and then truth. It, it, you can. It, you don't need to add any extra bit for, to these models for, for, to get the truth part. And, um, and then if you just consider what, 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 would, what will models have to be like for uh, the JTB account to hold in them. And, it, and if you actually explore what these models would have to be like, you see that they have to have a, a very um, specific and very odd form for, for the JTB account to hold. Um, and, um, and so that, and, and when you look, and when you look at as where the kind of thing that you'd expect to, to happen in these cases, um, you, you see that it would uh, that the JTB account. I mean, the, the, when it's first presented, people think that it's a rather elegant account. But if you look at the models, you see that it's not an elegant account at all. That it's a kind of w w weird uh, 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 account with very uh, as a very unnatural structure. And um, and you know you can also uh, and you can and you can you know on much more general grounds. Um, you can um, you can you can predict that you would get Getty cases. So, for example, I mean, of course, it's it's not that you can do epistemology without um, without making any any substantive epistemological judgments. I mean, we, we've, if we don't have any capacity to to um, reliably apply terms like knowledge and justification to begin with. We're not doing epistemology; isn't going to give us one. We have to, we have to start with something. Um, but you know, it, the, the, so the sort of thing that you can you can do is um, w where you can also predict Gettier cases is you, you can think of you can just think of examples where you you have a a good case, um, a bad case and an even worse case, right? Um, and so that, as it were, where, the, where, the, where, where and, you know, the structure of such examples would be, you know, you, you know a lot here, you know less here, and you know even less there. And then when you work through those examples with, with some some very basic uh, assumptions, uh, some of the basic assumptions, in fact, being, you know, if you make some assumptions that, that you need for the JTB account to work, you, could, you can see that you will get um, Gettier cases in, just from this kind of structure. And, you know, and so, although, I mean, it's not as though you've completely dispensed with examples, but what you can do is uh, put much less weight on the examples and, and make the examples be much more generic and and then do a lot more reasoning about the examples and then and the reason and the reasoning will tell you that there are bound to be Gettier cases here and um, so that uh, I mean the point the point is that this is some kind of independent confirmation right? because it's it's reaching the same conclusion as get Gettier's cases but but w with uh, as were a, a very different weighting of what, what, where the work, where most of the cognitive work is being done, so that as were you can you can make you, you can set it up in such a way that you don't need to make lots of knowledge judgments ab just about very very intricate cases, which is the kind where you, you know it's not so crazy to worry that we might be m misjudging, and and then still show that we get. get Gettier cases, and I, you know, and I think having done that, we, that that is um, that is some answer to to people. I mean, I mean, there have been people like, for example, Brian Weatherson, who've you know, who've suggested that it might be that uh, that really the, the the JTB account is that's the kind of natural notion of knowledge in the in the in the vicinity, and it's just that that you know, as it were, through some quirk of the human cognitive system, we're kind of not latching on to the the, the natural um, joint carving kind of notion of of knowledge. But but you know, I think if once you explore the models, you you, you can see that that is not the case. That that, that 
um, it, that, that it would have to be that knowledge was some kind of gerrymandered thing in order for it to satisfy the JTB of Kant. Um, okay, I have two questions. Uh, <clears throat> well, no, first, a comment. I mean, I was sort of puzzled when you sort of described uh, the activity of producing counterexamples and the activity of modeling as somehow two activities that were to some extent independent and, and uh, uh, perhaps because I, I'm sort of used of, uh, of thinking of formal modeling, uh, formally modeling a theory as a way of <coughs> in a sense making sharper pre predictions, I mean, making the predictions of the theory clearer and therefore making it easier to produce kind of examples, I mean, in a sense. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it, it seems that the activity that could feed each other, uh, activities that could feed each other in this sense, um, Yeah, so I'm I'm not thinking of um, of all formalization as the building of formal models. Um, so, for example, you know. It, you know, if if you take an an axiomatic theory, mm -hmm. uh, that is not I I I do, I do not count an, um, an axiomatic theory as a model. Um, I, I mean, if you well, if you take the mathematical case, I mean, you know, mo mo a model of set theory is one thing, and uh, and in, in this respect, that they're they're closer to the the, the models that I've been uh, talking about. Um, so, uh, but uh, whereas you know the ax you know a list of axioms for set theory is something something else um, and uh, and in the in the case of um, so i mean if we take the, the let's say the uh, hypotheses in, in semantics um, you know i think the that uh, you know we can we can we can produce a, you know a, a formal semantics which will then make various predictions and but then in you know with a lot of the the current methodology it's just that we make a, it predicts that some sentences are good and some sentences are are bad um, and and then you know and then there's a tendency to say well you know it, look here's a sentence which it gives the wrong prediction for so there's something wrong with the with the theory. Um, but um, if we were treating if we were treating the theory as a, a model, um, we we wouldn't just be rejecting it on the grounds that there wasn't this perfect fit with the data. And, and you know, suppose if we think of the data as let's say um, judgments about the well formedness or truth of, of sentences in. Mm -hmm. Uh, various hypothetical uh, scenarios. Um, we, you know, we might think, well, this model is is a, is a is this is still a pretty good model of whatever it is, but mm -hmm. um, but there may be some some extra noise uh, coming in from somewhere else. We don't know where. I, I mean, uh, so I mean, but it, it may also be, it may also be that. The, the, so of course one thing is, you know, this, this, whether it corresponds to, as it were, you know, this, this, the correct semantics in our, you know, in our language module or something like that. But it, I mean, even, it might even be that the correct, you know, that, that it doesn't fully correspond. But it's a good, it's a good model of that. Uh, I mean, and, it could, and because it could be that what's that what's actually in our heads is a bit of itself is a bit of a mess, <laughs> um, and um, that 
that the, you know, so that a certain uh, something could be the, the, the best available model of what's going on, even if it, it makes predictions which, which don't line up with native speaker judgments in certain cases? The best available model in the sense that um, there are no other models that make better prediction or the best available models in the sense that it's more elegant and most elegant. And, well, and, uh, I mean, it, so... It, economic it, and, and orderly and... I mean, so I think, I mean, both, both dimensions, you know, need to be taken into into a, account but um, I mean in, you know in the philosophy of language case um, so what I would think of as an, an early example of model building was um, Carnap uh, in something like meaning and necessity where he puts he puts forward a, a model of an intentional language um, which it, is, is is not intended to be a, a, a detailed representation of natural language at all. I mean, it's mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it it's not in, it's not intended to have um, much of the very much of the complexity of a natural language. And um, I mean, it's it's just meant to be a, a way of showing how a language could work. Mm -hmm. So that's so that's a case where it. It would be difficult. I mean, it would be difficult to f to produce a a counterexample to the kind of intentional languages that Carnap gives in meaning and necessity, because because they're not they're not really presented as a, a piece of um, natural language semantics. They're intended, you know, just as a way of showing how inten in intentional operators could work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in terms of a very sort of early form of possible world semantics, in, in effect, and so that's that's the case where you, where you have something which I think is clearly a formal model of an intentional language, but which is not which is not making predictions that could be tested against data, and you know, and it's and it's you know, but and it, and I think it was clearly you know an important step forward. But, I mean, because it, I mean, of course, in the end, it. Uh, there's a massive tradition of intentional semantics for um, for natural languages, which hasn't, you know, where people have made lots of predictions and met many which have been borne out and, and so on. But 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 I mean, there was a lot of progress involved in just putting forward such a model in the first place, even even when it, it did not have testable predictions. Okay, so in, in <clears throat> coming back to the example that you gave about uh, the uh, Gaetier's problem. Uh, so, I mean, there you were saying, um, I mean, in a sense, this is the kind of counter example that we would expect if uh, um, this is the kind of case that we would expect to arise uh, once we give a model uh, of the theory. Because, uh, because Having a theory that doesn't, in which this case doesn't arise, uh, would uh, would require a very weird model. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? I mean, yeah. I, so I, what I was, I, yeah. So what I was, okay. what I was doing there was I was saying, let's let's consider the hypothesis that the JTB account is a really good theoretical account of knowledge and, and then there's just somehow there's a lot of noise or something which is making it look not good uh, and where the uh, where it, it's not fitting it's not fitting our judgments but um, but that maybe the judgments are wrong and uh, and and so then then we can explore what what are the consequences of the JTB account in the kind of formal models in which we can represent it and um, so this, and, and then we, what we can see is, is that it's it, it's not a, it's it's not a nice account of, of, of knowledge. It's not as it were, it's not it's not one which which has the kind of theoretical virtues that might make us think that this is really the right way to uh, to go. But um, somehow we're rejecting it because 
you know, of what might, might be, if you like, corrupt <laughs> data or something like that. Um, and so you're saying that there will be independent uh, reason having to do with the model, independent from, yes. from the Gettier cases that would, that should advise yes. us to say, okay, that's not a good, going to be a yes. good model of, of knowledge. Yes, yes. So that it's, it, and it's, it, um, that we, we wouldn't expect knowledge, in fact, to have this, uh, this structure. But, uh, um, and, uh, you know, and so that... So, so what are these features that, that you think just make it... Uh, well, I mean, one, I mean one, of the, it, one of the features is the, the, that um, it, it, forces, um, it forces justification and knowledge to be in, incredibly close together. Um, in, um, so that there's all, so that there's all, they, roughly speaking, they only differ on, on one world. <laughs> Well, and, and so that's, so that's it, it's kind of, it's sort of weird that you should have that sort of effect. But, but also that you can, um, so in the, so the, actually, yes, I should, maybe I can explain a bit, little bit more what's going on in this uh, case. Um, so the kind of person who thinks that, Justification is a more fundamental notion than um, the knowledge. Um, is the kind of person who will. Uh, this goes back to what I was talking about in the, in, on Monday. That they're, they're, they're going to think that that you can have um, case that, that justification will be the same between these cases. I mean, remember, you know, I was saying that as where the kind of more internalist picture of justification is one in which um, it, justification is constant across good and, and bad cases. And so um, you can you can have um, cases w w where, as we're judged by that kind of internalist standard, which is the kind of standard that you'd expect from somebody who who regarded justification as a more basic notion than than knowledge. That you can have cases where justification, this exactly the same propositions are justified in all these three cases, but where um, the, the um, amount of knowledge that you have is, is decreasing um, here, from here to here, and again from here to here. And, um, and, you, would, and you, would ex you would expect that, um, that you'd have that, because, because, the, because their picture is, look, the, the appearances are uh, remaining the same in all three cases. But the, the kind of things that you need for knowledge, which, you know, in, you know about how the, the perceptual processes are actually working and so on, they, they, they can be gradually degenerating as you go, do, you go down the scale. And, uh, and so that, you, that, that as well, the, the bad case might be just a case where there's, you know, you, you're, there's a, a little bit of, you know, sl some slight distortion and the, and the re even worse case might be a radical skeptical scenario where you're a brain in a vat or something. And, and so the, you'd, ex you'd expect that kind of gradation, but, but then you can show that that's inconsistent with the being uh, no Gettier cases. Um, and um, because, because the, the, the idea that the justification is... Um, it has to be the same in, in all three cases. And the idea that the knowledge is, um, is decreasing, uh, that, that's inconsistent with JTB holding, because JTB requires a very, very close match between knowledge and justification, even though not, not a 100% match. And, um, and, and you can't have a, uh, that, that close a match between justification and knowledge in, in all three cases. So that, so the, the, the kind of thing that's going on here is that you can, you, you can just give structural arguments why the, the, these, are in, <laughs> these, these sorts of constraints uh, you wouldn't, wouldn't, are not going to be, be able to hold in, in general. And, 
Um, you know, I mean, of course, these structural arguments, I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, they're not presuppositionless or anything like that, but they're, 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 they're drawing on a sufficiently different range of considerations that I think we are, you know, we are getting support for the original Getty Eight judgments from, you know, from a somewhat different source. Or at least they may, or at least they may tell us which direction we should go when we try to look for a solution to Gettier's argument, which is to exclude some possible directions, I suppose. Yeah. Well, well you see, of course, my, my view is that, um, that the, the problem was wrongly posed in the first place and, uh, and um, that, that, you know, that we shouldn't be trying to, to, to understand uh, knowledge in, in in terms of these kind of components at, uh, yeah. at all. Uh, uh, may I ask another? The last, the last no, one. no, no, then. Yeah. Because I'm going back to, to something that is sort of, I mean, very, something you said at the beginning that was sort of puzzling me. When, when you answered the question about uh, um, Stolnaker, at some point you said that you think that one, something that, which is sort of bad about Stonemaker's theory is that it sort of assimilates the case of, of knowledge and belief of humans to knowledge and belief of animals because, um, uh, and, and, and you thought that, you know, there was a, there there was, it, it, there was a difference that we shouldn't overlook, which is that in the case of humans, knowledge and belief is mediated by language uh, yes. somehow. Uh, I, I was puzzled by that because you, I mean, one of the uh, reasons that Stonecker gives for individuating proposition the, propositions the way he does is exactly that, um, that it accounts for the fact that we can make a scripture of knowledge and belief uh, to humans and to animals. Yes. And, and, uh, um, and in fact, we do say that, you know, an animal believes that, you know, some kind of creature crept up a tree, yes. I mean, and so on. So are you suggesting that when we do ascription of beliefs uh, uh, to animals and when we do it to humans, there are different relations involved? No, I think, I think that, that there are the, um, I mean, fundamentally, the, no, I mean, knowledge and belief. Are, I mean, they're univocal in these cases. So, I, yeah, so, I, um, so it's not it's not that, but it's that. I mean, the the kind of cases that his account has um, great difficulty uh, with are are cases where this we have. The same proposition uh, expressed by by r radically different sentences, and you know, I, I, um, and uh, and I think that the, the sort of way that he, I mean, the way he tries to deal with it is by by you know using diagonal contents and um, and in a, in effect making the contents meta linguistic, which I think is. It, it's both utterly implausible in, in the case of something like mathematics and and also in the end doesn't avoid the problems because um, the because for example well supposing we take the case of um, inconsistent beliefs um, the so you know the inconsistent. I mean, suppose let's say somebody believed, you know, that, that Fermat's last theorem was false or something like that. The, I mean, the incon um, So the idea is that they end up just inconsistent. I mean, they end up with a false but not inconsistent but belief that a certain sentence expressed a truth. But I mean, in fact, when when you, I mean, I think this is a point that Kripke originally made. Um, when you combine that. Uh, mathematical, uh, you know, the belief that a certain sentence expresses a truth with some very basic semantic knowledge that they, or belief that they already ha have, you, you still get an inconsistency. And, you know, and so it doesn't, it's not really a way of restoring uh, consistency. And, um, and I, th you know, so I, th I think w w one, 
you know, if we take if we take the question of, of inconsistent belief, I, you know, I think um, that that we, we should. I mean, so, so supposing somebody, you know, we have somebody who who believes, you know, Hesperus is is bright and uh, phosphorus is not bright, or something like that. Because you know, in a Frege puzzle case. Um, I think what we have to do is, is, is I, don't, I don't think that in the end, I mean, this is a different sort of case, but I'm, I'm, uh, I don't think the metalinguistic strategy will, will work. But I think what we, can, um, what we can do is to say something like, um, you know, so-and-so believes the, the, the proposition, I mean, there's a single proposition, P, such that this is P and this is, not p, right? Uh, I'm assuming some kind of direct reference theory. So that that um, th so we've got an agent who believes um, p, you know, under the roughly speaking uh, under the guise of of the sentence Hesperus is bright, and they believe not p under the guise of the sentence phosphorus is not bright, and that enables us to understand um, why th they 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 do not believe zero equals one or something like. Like that, um, and and so so we can we can give a more nuanced description of, of their beliefs um, that takes account of uh, of the fact that uh, that they're believing these things under linguistic guises, and um, and then you know so we can you know say that they believe P and that. I mean, one thing where we might do it is that they believe P and they believe not P, but there are lots of other things that, th that they don't believe. So they, you know, let's say they, they don't believe zero equals one or something like that. Um, and, um, but that, that's impossible, you know, on Stolnaker's account, where, where, you, where you, you take it that the uh, accessibility semantics it, it really does give you the right semantics for belief because then because if, if you if they do believe P and they do believe not P then they have to end up b believing um, believing everything because um, and and so I th you know I think that by just sort of you know insisting on um, you know on, on the accessibility semantics it his um, he's excluding uh, um, the more kind of nuanced uh, accounts that it is possible to give of these cases, where where we, although we take the beliefs as, as directed at uh, propositions, you know, maybe even Stolnicker style propositions, but we also take that that as being mediated by by vehicles of some kind, and and that could, that could also apply to animals, um, but there would be non linguistic vehicles in the case of animals. I mean, animals would be subject to Frege cases, but as it were, because they fail to to recognise something as the same again under two perceptual modes of presentation or something like that. So, thank you very much. You have been very generous <laughs> with us, with all our doubt, our questions. Well, that's your we job. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we really enjoyed your lecture. Right. Thank, well, you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. <laughs>